Good afternoon and good evening to some of our participants whom I would like to thank very much for joining us at this late hour. My name is Megan DeBroat and I will be chairing the second panel of our Schiller Institute conference this weekend. The title of our panel is The Role of Science in Creating Mankind's Future. Now this morning, we had a very sobering discussion of the dangers which are threatening all nations of the planet now in the form of an increasingly unstable and confronta confrontational world strategic picture and the steps that must be taken to navigate our way out of those waters. And there is a way forward, a way toward a completely different civilization, uh, future for civilization. But this requires that we change the basis upon which nations relate to one another to be one of the common aims of mankind. As Helga Zepp-LaRouche put it this morning in her keynote address, leaders must have the courage to project an image of a new future for the human species. Now in 2014, the economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche wrote a document to that end which was called the four new laws to save the USA now, not an option, an immediate necessity. The fourth and perhaps the primary of those laws called for an international crash science driver program in nuclear fusion and implicitly its cousin, the space program. Fusion and space are the areas of frontier scientific work which would be complete game changers for all people in all nations. And by their nature, these areas necessitate international cooperation for the common progress of all. Our panel this afternoon represents top leaders and top scientists in these fields on the international stage. People who have taken it upon themselves to think about solving the big problems facing mankind by pushing the boundaries of our scientific and te technological capabilities. In 2016, a few days after the US election, Lyndon LaRouche said the following, which for me sums up the purpose of what we're trying to do with our discussion this afternoon. You're going to develop and extend the power of mankind in the universe and for the universe. The time has come to get human beings to think in these terms now, because if you don't do that, you will fail. So therefore, you have to have the sense that you are a universal personality reaching into space reaching into areas of development of mankind beyond what mankind had ever done before. What's your purpose in life? Your purpose in life is to reach beyond what mankind has reached before. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, let me say that we will have ample time for questions and answers at the end of our panel today. So if you are watching live and have a question for any of our speakers, you can send it to questions at schillerinstitute.org. Our first speaker, Jason Ross, is a science advisor to the Schiller Institute. Jason has done extensive work in the science of physical economy and how that can serve as the basis for economic policy making to overcome the underdevelopment in the world. He's a co-author on the Schiller Institute's 2017 report, Extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa. His topic today is the development of higher platforms of science and technology, the key to human progress. Jason. Thank you, Megan, very happy to be here. So throughout his career, Lyndon LaRouche was the American political figure most well known for his advocacy of nuclear fusion as the absolutely essential next step in human progress. In the mid 1970s, LaRouche founded the Fusion Energy Foundation dedicated to making nuclear fusion a reality. The FEF published a journal, a magazine and books 
and its members were involved in the legislative process and in the discussions with Ronald Reagan about what Reagan proposed under the name Strategic Defense Initiative, a proposal to work with the Soviet Union to develop new defensive technologies, including lasers, for knocking out nuclear weapons to make the world safe from nuclear extinction. LaRouche believed that it was only by superseding past science and technology that poverty could be entirely eliminated, the problem of resource depletion could be overcome, and humanity would be able to perform the next generation of experiments to discover the next generation of scientific principles. This is a process of unending growth of the human species that mirrors the developments we've seen both in the biosphere, with an increasing complexity and energy intensity of life, and in the universe as a whole, with the formation of complex celestial structures whose mysteries we have only begun to explore. In this presentation, we'll take up three topics. One, the economic value of scientific progress. Two, the infrastructural, industrial, political, and cultural platform by which scientific progress changes our lives. And third, how great visions for scientific and technological advance bring us to an understanding of the universality of the potential immortality of the individual human being, the individual human mind. Human economy exists because of that which distinguishes us absolutely from the animals, the ability of the individual human mind to develop a hypothesis, an idea, that embodies something perceived not by the senses, but which acts upon the perceived world. That is, a hypothesis of a universal physical principle. These discoveries are like tools, but they aren't physical tools. An ape might use a stick to extract a meal of termites out of a mound in the earth, and a sea otter may use rocks to crack shellfish to consume, but only human beings use electromagnetism, navigation, geometry, poetry, fire, mathematics, and music. Only our beautiful species, sharing a universality of the powers of our mind, unlike any animal, has built irrigation systems to improve access to food, transformed other species through the selective breeding that has given us modern grains, fruits, vegetables, even animals, liberated the power of coal to produce motion with the steam engine, freeing people from drudgery and making it possible to produce goods for common people, created transportation networks to bring our societies closer together, and even left this planet to set foot on the moon itself, which animals can see, but cannot understand or visit, unless we bring them as pets. Scientific hypotheses by which we reduce the imperfection of our understanding of the world around us are the ultimate source of economic wealth, the means by which we improve the productivity of our labor and the springboards to developing yet better hypotheses. How are these discoveries made? And how certain can we be of our knowledge? Consider the problem of induction. If I observe something to happen without fail 100 times, Am I guaranteed that it will happen again the 101st time? Imagine a turkey being fattened up for Thanksgiving. Every day it is fed well and taken care of, each day providing more evidence to Mr. Turkey that life is good until Thanksgiving arrives. Repeated experience is not the basis of knowledge. The escape of the problem of induction is the concept of the crucial experiment in which we use a hypothesized cause to create something that has never happened before. How many times do you need to observe an electric motor working to conclude that there is a connection between electricity and magnetism? You don't need 100 experiments to convince yourself of the Pythagorean theorem if you've shown geometrically why it must always be true. How many hydrogen bonds needed to be exploded to validate the basic understanding that gave rise to them? As Einstein reminded the world a little over a century ago, our knowledge is never perfect, but it is perfectible. The universe rewards our knowledge, less imperfect than it used to be, with improved power to reshape the physical world, to discover ways of improving our livelihoods and learn yet more. 
Unlike the animals, our carrying capacity is neither limited nor predetermined. Progress brings about higher levels of population and of potential population density for the human species. This brings us to the second topic, how scientific discoveries are implemented into society. How does a discovery in the mind become effective in society? How does a thought manifest itself into improved living conditions? Well, LaRouche discussed the relationship between discoveries, infrastructure, and production in his 2005 paper, Science, the Power to Prosper. He wrote, all discovered valid notions of any universal physical principle implicitly define a field, a field which is the functional notion of the extension of the efficacy of that principle throughout the universe as a whole. It is the action expressed by the impact of the potential expressed by a field upon the setting in which production occurs, which is the focus of our concern in this report as a whole. For example, the application of Dirichlet's principle to any field of action elevates the experimental viewpoint from a collection of calculations to a single act of conceptual thought, a conception which, like Kepler's notion of universal gravitation, efficiently subsumes implicitly all of the relevant detailed calculations. It is impossible to develop any competent insight into the way a modern economy functions physically, except by employing the way of looking at a field in the way Riemann's treatment of what he terms Dirichlet's principle applies. The understanding of this point, which I am developing here, enables us to understand why the transfer of the production of a product, even when the same technology of design and production is employed from a developed economy to a less developed economy, has usually resulted during the recent quarter century in a net collapse of the level of the rate of generation of per capita productivity in the world as a whole. The transfer of production from a nation with advanced development of its infrastructure to a nation of relatively poor people with a poor development of general infrastructure tends to produce a collapse of the physical economy of the planet as a whole. The role of the field represented by basic economic infrastructure has been ignored with what tend to become ultimately fatal economic results for all concerned. By choosing a field of application, which itself represents a zone of lower potential, the effective productivity of labor per capita and per square kilometer is relatively reduced. To unpack that, let's use the introduction of electricity into the rural areas of the United States as a case study to look at how an improved infrastructure platform based on a new discovery transforms society and productivity. The Rural Electrification Administration created by an executive order by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1935 and funded through the Rural Electrification Act of 1936 it was created at a time when electricity was becoming widespread in American cities, but still nearly 90% of American farms lacked access to electricity. Why? Well, the costs of stringing wires to those farms was considered prohibitive in light of the small electrical use per household as forecast by the electric companies. Using their understanding of the past, they didn't think it was worth the money to bring the lines to bring power to America's farms. The REA made loans to farmer co-ops, uh, farmer cooperatives, to build their own power lines and even to purchase appliances and equipment. The results were stunning. The electricity was not simply inserted into an otherwise unchanged geometry, used only to power the radios, washing machines, and light bulbs of city dwellers. Rather, it had the effect of transforming the productive potential of the farms. Three examples. Refrigeration reduced disease from food poisoning and ensured that more of the agricultural produce could be consumed rather than being wasted. Lighting in chicken coops increased egg production significantly, particularly in the, um, particularly in the colder, darker winter months. The chickens weren't re-engineered, but their environment, the field in which they lived, 
was changed. And electric pumping saved dozens of hours per family per year compared to the backbreaking labor of using a hand-operated water pump. The project was a success. By 1951, the proportion had been reversed. Instead of 90% of American farms lacking electricity, now 90% were on the grid. This was an incredible shift in potential productivity when a more advanced platform of infrastructure exists to support it and it can be carried out again in many ways. Consider what nuclear fusion will mean for the world. It's not just cheaper electrical power or doing what we already do more easily or more cheaply. Think about the new things that we can do. A fusion torch can vaporize and dissociate waste, separating it into its constituent atoms. That's recycling. Currently, essentially all production of new non-recycled metal from rocky ores requires the mining of coal, not only for its energy content, but for its chemical activity in the carbon drawing out the oxygen. This is an antique method which can be superseded with the energies that fusion can bring. And space travel will no longer be limited to the energy density of chemical fuels which are not susceptible of much improvement beyond their current levels. Rather than spending nine months going to Mars, we can go there in just a couple of weeks by leaving the engine on as we're on our way, rather than just using it at the beginning and coasting to that destination, which is what we do now. Even with this coasting, most of the mass of a rocket going to the moon, look at that, it's enormous. Most of that is fuel. That's what you see in blue. In one sense, chemical fuel is just barely able to bring us to other celestial bodies. We need something better. Water shortages, they're becoming an increasing issue around the world where groundwater supplies are being drawn down faster than they are replenished. But there's plenty of water in the oceans. Nuclear fusion would make it economical to desalinate ocean and other brackish water on a broad agricultural scale, far surpassing the small projects that exist today Primarily, primarily geared towards urban use. Energy intense manufacturing processes using large currents or high powered lasers will usher in a new generation of production techniques. In short, fusion power as a platform will enable tremendous improvements in the productive powers of labor. We should look for such progress that can create a 10 times improvement rather than only small marginal gains. Now, here's Lyndon LaRouche writing on this topic in 2010. He says, we should then recognize that the development of basic economic infrastructure had always been a needed creation of what is required as a habitable development of a synthetic rather than a presumably natural environment for the enhancement or even the possibility of human life and practice at some time in the existence of our human species. Man, as a creator in the likeness of the great creator, is expressed by humanity's creation of the artificial environments we sometimes call infrastructure, on which both the progress and even the merely continued existence of civilized society depends. In addition to the new platforms possible with fusion power, the current pandemic should remind us of the importance of making breakthroughs in biology. So what is the effect of living in a society committed to progress in which every decade brings a better life than the past? Clearly, there'll be a great deal of happiness at being able to live more easily and also a cultural connection to the beautiful potential of the human species itself, which is the third and final topic of this talk. Lyndon LaRouche wrote in 2004 that the conspicuous shortfall of otherwise talented leaders among us is that we have become a nation which, for all its current rant about religion, has no actual conception of a real form of immortality. In this mass entertainment-soaked, where's-my-money citizenry of today, there are few Jean d'Arcs, Abraham Lincolns, or Reverends Martin Luther King among us who are prepared to put all that which is mortal in them as a talent on the altar of service to the foreseeable good of the future of mankind. That was Lyndon LaRouche in Reanimating the World's Economy. 
A great leader, such as those mentioned in this quotation, acts in the present to change the future, of course, but also the past. The contributions of those who achieve victory in the American Revolution over the world's foremost source of evil, the British Empire, well, that took on renewed meaning through Abraham Lincoln's success in defending the Union and in Dr. King's achievements in leading the country into greater coherence with the ideas of equality and the pursuit of happiness that motivated the nation's initial creation. In these days, when identity politics is reaching a fever pitch and people are drawn apart under a microscopic intersectionalism of heredity, religion, geographic background, sexual orientation, and what is called race, it is more important than ever to bring to people the challenge of acting on our universality. The discoveries of the great thinker remain valid even after they die. Louis Pasteur is dead, but his discoveries live on and continue to safeguard our health. Marie Curie is no more, but her breakthroughs continue to animate our pursuit of the truth. Albert Einstein has passed away, but his epic reconceptualization of space and time and energy and matter offers ever new puzzles to tease our imagination into discovering more about the universe. Dr. King was assassinated, but his devotion to his enlightened understanding of the human condition continues to inspire. A functional immortality isn't simply about dying and martyrdom. Being willing to die to defend or burn down a dentist's office, a sandwich shop, or a furniture store misses the point. Will we wipe out poverty on this entire planet? Will we develop defenses against comets and coronaviruses? Will we create for our children and grandchildren a future in which they will have the opportunity to address their minds to new scientific inquiries and a culture that fosters that pursuit, creating a world worthy of the dignity of the human individual, both here on Earth and up above it? Or Will we shackle ourselves to centuries old sources of power like wind and condemn ourselves to destitution compared to that abundance that could be ours? The answer lies with us. Thank you very much, Jason. Our next presenter, we are very honored to have with us Dr. Bernard Bigot is the Director General of the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, which is the world's largest and co a collaborative effort to demonstrate the feasibility of fusion power. Dr. Bigot is the former Director of the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, and he's joining us today from Cadarache, France. The title of his presentation is The ITER Project, Hydrogen Fusion for the World Energy Supply. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate to the International Schiller Institute uh, conference. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to the ITER Project. He has to demonstrate that uh, hydrogen fusion could be an option for the world energy supply in the future. As you see on this slide, you have the ITER site with uh, various uh, um, building and equipment on their way to be uh, uh, erected and, and installed. And so is precisely what I want to uh, introduce you uh, on this uh, large project, which is gathering 35 different countries and seven large partners. Everybody knows that uh, we have to face the limitation of the use of the fossil fuel, how we are using it for now more than 150 years, and the alternate option is indeed limited. We have to rely on uh, some well-known physical phenomena. Clearly, we may have the renewable energies, they are quite attractive, but from my point of view, it's a partial solution, because low power density coupled with intermittent for large population concentration, the mega cities and industrial production requirement uh, massive uh, energy sources, well predicted. Nuclear fission is also an option, certainly, but as you know, there is some drawback and also limitation because uh, uranium resources are not infinite. So we need to find another solution, another option, and we have to look at what's happened in the universe. 
in the universe, the one common way to produce energy is hydrogen fusion, as in the sun and the stars. The sun is, as you know, maybe, is just a big bubble of hydrogen, 300,000 times the weight of the Earth, and at the center of the sun, there is a very high hot plasma, 15 million degrees, a high density plasma, and they fuse and produce energy. How they do that? Okay, they are just uh, pressing on hydrogen nuclei, making them getting closer and closer, and at a very short distance, they fuse and produce two new particles, neutrons and helium. They are going away with a lot of energy. On Earth, it is not the same way we can produce, as you could imagine. So it's why the physicist has been bright enough in order to imagine an alternate option. The alternate option is to use a very low density plasma, but at a higher temperature, 150 million degrees, 10 times the temperature of the sun core. And in that condition, you are able to accelerate the hydrogen nuclei in such a way they get very high speed. And when they collide, they will fuse with a high uh, uh, availability and they will produce two new particles, the same helium nuclei as well as a neutron. And as you see on this picture, the energy of the helium get out of the collision with an energy which is of the order of five times larger than the energy of the collision, and the neutron is 20 times. And these two particles will hit the wall and transfer their kinetic energy to heat. It is a way we could produce energy with uh, hydrogen fusion. The good point is that there is a very high density of energy in this uh, phenomena, since uh, one gram of fusion, fusion fuel is equivalent to eight ton of oils. So there is very large advantage of these technologies because uh, it could be a source of massive, predictable, and potentially continuous or even viable power complementary to renewable energies. It is safe, only two grams of hydrogen at a given time, and even if he, any parameter just deviates from the normal uh, values, uh, the reaction just uh, stops. There is also environmentally responsible because we produce only helium, which is a very okay, non-active chemicals as well as non-radioactive materials. And there is almost limitless supply of fuel for hundreds of millions of years, widely distributed around the world, and no impact on climate since no greenhouse gas emission. Furthermore, no long-lasting high-activity radioactive material, only a small part of them coming from the tritium and maybe some activated parties of the walls, of the reactor. So the ITER mission is quite simple, to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion power for peaceful purpose, to produce for this a burning plasma, as I mentioned, 150 million degrees, and to achieve a yield of over 10 when you compare the thermal output of the fusion reaction with the uh, 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 power you have to uh, inject in the plasma. Size is absolutely critical. Size matters. As you see, the world record now for hydrogen fusion is at the jet in Europe, and uh, the volume of the plasma is 80 cubic meters. In ITER, it will be 10 times larger. The power you are injecting in the uh, jet plasma is of the order of 23 megawatt but you produce only 16 megawatt of power fusion, which means a yield which is below one. It is not so attractive. While for ITER, the uh, heating power is three times larger, is two times larger, sorry, and indeed uh, the fusion power is 30 times larger. So definitely size matter, which make this option a little bit more complicated than some others. How could we do uh, this uh, collision with uh, 150 million degrees and a very high speed? Uh, no other way but to use what we call magnetic forces, not the gravitational one, as in the sun and the star, but magnetic forces. I'm sure you remember, okay, when you have an electrical particle nearby, uh, a magnetic field, the particle is captured by the magnetic field and also continuously accelerating, spinning around 
Okay, the magnetic line. So it's why we need to uh, assemble very large magnetic cages. And you see the size of these uh, uh, cages uh, with the 18 vertical coils, six uh, horizontal ones, and the central solenoids. All of them okay, are nearly 20 meters large and 20 meters high. And we need a very high precision in order that okay, the particle could circulate very efficiently on the magnetic circular magnetic line. And is why we need to position the axis of the magnetic cages with a precision below millimeter compared to the axis of the vacuum vessel, which we name okay, the turret tokamak. So it is a reason of its uh, size and complexity, which has pushed 35 different countries, okay, associated with uh, seven large members, you, know, you see the, the flag on the side, in order to collaborate uh, in uh, demonstrate the feasibility of hydrogen fusion. Large agreement has been reached indeed in uh, June 2205 among the seven members, and uh, the ITER agreement has been signed in November 2006 in Paris, as you see on this picture. And the seven ITER members all together represent more than 50% of the world population and about 85% of the global GDP. Because all the members are really convinced that uh, hydrogen fusion could be a breakthrough in the future for world energy supply, they have decided they will produce in kind the various components of the equipment. And uh, in this condition, they could train their best uh, industry to uh, demonstrate the feasibility and capacity of uh, uh, this uh, manufacturing of the large component, magnetic coils, vacuum vessel, and all the other equipment. Now, uh, it is quite challenging to achieve the required qualities. Why? We need to have a long planning. We decided in 2015, after a thorough revision of uh, the project, to go on and have a, a schedule which uh, should lead us with the first plasma by 2025, as you see on this picture, after we receive during these precise years, 2020, 2021, 22, all the large components and assemble them before end of 2024 and after that commissioning the equipment. First plasma, 2025. And after that, we will have what we call a stage approach uh, to the full fusion power with uh, the special brand of, uh, of fuels, the deuterium tritium. And you see it will be a sequence where we will install some complementary equipment, okay, how we collect the energy, how we heat up uh, more efficiently by just uh, with uh, the magnetic fields, and also recycling okay, the fuel when uh, it has uh, been uh, fusing in the, uh, uh, in the uh, tokamak. As you see, the complexity of the management is related to the decision uh, of this in-kind sharing uh, of all the manufacturing of the component uh, and with the uh, requirement that uh, the ITER members will share all intellectual properties. It is an image here of the tokamak, as you see, and uh, it is just a cut. And uh, you notice, uh, for example, the vacuum vessel, which is a torus embedded within okay, the magnetic cages. And uh, all the different components will be uh, within, uh, within a, what we call a cryostat because the temperature needs to be quite low for the superconducting coils at minus 270 degrees. All over the world, big progress are now going on with uh, many uh, manufacturing components on their way in China with uh, what we call the polyvinyl field coil. Indeed, these uh, coils is complete and has been uh, transported on the ITER site. It's now to be checked uh, and before uh, final position within the tokamak. As well, uh, you see in India, uh, the uh, top lid of the tokamak is uh, now complete. It will be shipped to the ITER site. Uh, Japan also delivered very well. Okay, the tape coil, the toroidal field coil, the vertical one I mentioned before. Europe also is producing the vacuum vessel pieces as well as Korea. And indeed, we have the first vacuum vessel sectors. There is nine sectors. As you cut an orange, for example, 
in the different parts, in different pieces. And the first one is now arrived safely on site and fully compliant with the requirement. Also, the US and the, uh, Russia are providing some materials, as you could see on this slide. Even on the site, the largest piece, uh, which could not be transported, are on their way to be uh, completed. Uh, they are what we call the poloidal field call. The largest one is 24 meter diameters, and it is uh, not considering viable to transport them from uh, another country. So is why we experienced during this last two months quite massive arri arrival of uh, many components, as you see, some coils, some uh, also equipment, which are now on site and ready for assembly. So we are now preparing uh, all these uh, different uh, components, including these uh, first tutorial field coils, uh, which arrive on site uh, in order to be able to assemble them. To do that, we need to have all uh, the civil works ready in order to accommodate the equipment. And you see on this slide, many buildings are on their way to be completed and finished in order to accommodate the equipment. Now, we could see that we are more than 70% of the work uh, completed from the early design to first plasma. And since uh, we are progressing quite well uh, during the last five months at a rhythm of the order of 0.7%, okay, we feel that we are still on track in order to achieve the challenging goal of uh, First Plasma 2025. We are really preparing now uh, for machine assembling due to the fact that the civil works is well advanced and we have the component on site. And in particular, uh, during the summer, we have moved what we call the cryostat base, as well as the okay, lower and upper cylinder, uh, which are uh, large boxes of 30 meter diameters, 30 meter high. And uh, they are now moved uh, to the Tokamak pit, to the okay, uh, building where uh, the, uh, the plasma will be, uh, will be fusing. Uh, and you see this large, uh, uh, what we call cryostat base, has been lifted up uh, up to uh, nearly uh, 50 meters above the ground and uh, has been deposited uh, on, uh, on the Tokamak piece, as you could see on this uh, slide. Uh, even earlier this week, it has been done. Very impressive a challenge of the larger size as well as uh, the precision with we, we have to position this equipment. They have been positioned with a precision which is below 5 millimeters. So we are really ready now to go for first uh, pre-assembly, pre-assembly of the vacuum vessel on site, as well as the torrido field call with the assembling line. And we are now commissioning all these uh, different uh, uh, sequence in order to be sure that we do it safely and with high quality. So I hope I convince you that hydrogen fusion is on its way to be an option for the world energy supply. There is large benefit, still a lot of challenge in order to demonstrate. We feel that it will be possible after First Plasma 2025 to go on for full fusion power 10 years later, 2035, and by the year 2040, 2050, to have made the, for the needed demonstration that the utility could consider this technology and uh, replace and substitute the large consumption of fossil fuel to produce energy, to produce electricity in complementarity with uh, uh, renewable energies. Indeed, these two technologies could be complement very well each other. One is massive, is fully predictable, and the other one, as you know, is diffuse and intermittent. So we have an option for the future. Thank you, Dr. Bigot. Our next presenter, Dr. Stephen Dean, is the president and founder of Fusion Power Associates based in the United States. Uh, Dr. Dean was there from almost the very beginning of the fusion program in the United States, working at the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1960s, and eventually serving as the head of the Confinement Systems Division in the Office of Fusion Energy at the Department of Energy. 
I've entitled his presentation, and I hope he doesn't mind, um, Achieving Fusion Power, Where We've Been and How We'll Get There. Could you describe the history of the U.S. Fusion Program and its achievements? Well, in the 1970s, uh, tokamaks that were invented, actually, and demonstrated first in, uh, in Moscow at the Kurchatov Institute, uh, was so attractive that the whole world started building them of various sizes, and progress was very rapid. And uh, the U.S. built a uh, facility at Princeton called the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor, and uh, Europe built a facility called JET that is still in operation. Uh, and both of these uh, achieved the fusion conditions. And uh, so we, the world was ready to move ahead very rapidly in the, in the 70s from these achievements. And the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, actually passed the Magnetic Fusion Engineering Act of 1980, uh, saying that we, U.S. was ready to spend $20 billion in order to have a fusion power plant on the grid by the year 2000. And so we were ready to go and do that. And we were planning to build a, a facility like the present day Eater in the 1980s. But the Congress never provided the money to implement uh, that act that was passed by Congress. And so things slowed down. And in 1985, Reagan and Gorbachev got together and said they would build it as an international project. And all the rest of the world then joined in on that. And that became the Eater Venture that's uh, now coming to Operation soon. And ITER has been a prime example of how successful the world can work together to uh, do something like this. And of course, as you know, it's being built in France right now. What have been the consequences of the cuts to the U.S. fusion budget over the decades? So the real momentum for fusion and the real big facilities for fusion are all being looked at elsewhere. For example, uh, in Japan, a huge fusion uh, new experiment called JT60 Superconducting just came in operation, uh, I think this year, or it's just the construction is just being finished. And so, and in uh, Europe, in the uh, in, uh, UK, the JET experiment is still running. Whereas in the US, our tokamak fusion test reactor got shut down. So we're totally dependent right now on the international effort for what the time scale for bringing fusion online for electricity is. The U.S. does not have a commitment right now to actually build anything like a power plant or a prototype power plant, although we have a study going on right now by the National Academies looking at what's called a pilot plant as a goal. But it's, it's, a, it's a goal, and I mean, it's an idea, but it's not yet agreed to by the government that the U.S. is actually going to do it. So you have to look at our budget as just being our budget and, and just a small contribution, maybe a less than 20 percent contribution to what is really a world effort. And all the countries of the world of scientists are working very closely together so that if it's China or Japan or India or Europe, uh, all of them know the same thing. <laughs> and so all of them are ready depending on their government policies to step forth. And the, uh, in China, for example, the, uh, the size of the program has been expanding rapidly, exceeds the number of people working in China now and fusion exceeds the number working here in the same way in Europe. And so we're just a small part of the world effort. And uh, it's really the world effort now that you have to look at and the world facilities that are being built to, to judge you know, how fast we are moving. Is it important to have a robust domestic fusion program in addition to the international level? Well, you can't have a successful international program unless all the parties have a, ro a robust national program because they all have to have enough smarts and, and capabilities to contribute and pull their weight to the international venture. And they all, they all have to be prepared to capitalizes on, capitalize on the successes of the international project to move their own programs forward. And it's important that each country has a plan of their own how to step forward beyond ITER to the power plant because the energy markets, the electricity markets in each country uh, operate very differently. So it's important for every country to decide what they're going to do beyond ITER that's 
best prepare, prepare, prepared them to uh, make Fusion a success in their market. Could you give us a sense of the scope of the work being done in Fusion around the world today? Well, one of the interesting things I think that's happened in the last several years is the emergence of a bunch of small companies that are being funded mostly by private money. And I think that's happening because Eater is making people feel that Fusion is real and Eater is make, and making people think, well, maybe there's a way to do it faster or cheaper than what it's costing for Eater because we're all smarter now. And so we have now uh, the phenomenon really of oh, I, more than a dozen of these small companies around the world. Most of them, are, I think, are in the US, but they're in uh, Europe and they're in the UK. Also, uh, small companies that are getting sizable amounts of money and have very ambitious plans. And some of them, for example, Tokamak Energy in um, the UK, private sector company. It's a variation on the Tokamak. It's not the conventional Tokamak, but it's a smaller, improved Tokamak called the spherical Tokamak. And so uh, companies like that, they are, I visited there in March and they have, they've already built an experiment and they've already got plans to go beyond. And the, the Cullum Lab in, in uh, Europe also has one, an experiment of that type and they're all working together. And Princeton is actually uh, uh, bringing into operation in a couple of years a bigger tokamak of that type, the spherical torus. So that's in a competition to the conventional tokamak, and it's it's right now the leader in that area for getting to power is tokamak energy in in the UK. And so there are other companies that are following concepts that are not tokamaks at all, like TAE Technologies in. Uh, the U.S. It's using a variation of a concept called the uh, the, um, the mirror concept or the field reverse concept, and they've they've built two generations of machines, and they have good funding, and they've got plans to bring on a demonstration power plant in the next ten or fifteen years that would be not looking like a tokamak at all. Uh, it's behind the tokamak scientifically, and it's behind the tokamak in achievements so far but it's moving fast and it's being built on a, on a physics basis that's been around for quite some time. And I think uh, we were going to mention, or I was going to mention that you know, the tokamak and these other concepts based on, uh, is based on tokamak like physics or mirror physics, mirror confinement physics. There's a whole other approach to fusion called inertial confinement, which is based mostly on lasers. And there's a little company in Germany called Marvel Energy, which is looking at ways to capitalize on developments, um, breakthroughs in laser technology to try to uh, move that whole area along faster. And that's based on some of the work that's been going on at uh, Lawrence Livermore on a big, the biggest laser in the world called the, um, the National Ignition Facility. And there's programs in the US that support that at Rochester and the Naval Research Lab. But there's this little company in Germany at Garsching called Marvel Energy that wants to, to take all of that and move the whole thing faster with uh, the, these petawatt lasers, which, which aren't being used in the conventional inertial confinement. So there's a lot of innovation going on. There's a lot of uh, progress in all of the different areas. And uh, as I say, there's a dozen little companies. Uh, there's even a company in the US called Zap Energy, which is going back to one of the very original concepts that people tried in the 50s on fusion called the pinch, which is basically looks like a, a fluorescent light with instead of a few amps of current down the tube, uh, put the, a million amps of current down the tube. And these were always unstable when you tried to do that. But they've got the idea that, well, if you just uh, put a little twist on this uh, twin pinch as you make it, it won't go unstable, or at least it won't go unstable very fast. And maybe you can get enough fusion out of that. And that's an extremely simple idea. But if it works, and if you can keep it stable for a long enough time with that geometry, you mean it's extremely simple. And one of the things electric utilities are looking for is technologies that aren't so complicated that they've never used before that they've got to figure out how to make them work on a 
on a very reliable basis to make electricity for you know months and years on ends without having to do a lot of maintenance. If we did have full funding and support of the U.S. domestic program, how might that affect the timeline for achieving fusion? Well, in the, in the United States, it would uh, affect it tremendously because uh, if the money starts to come in and the quantities that we envisaged, you know, escalated to today's dollars, what that would mean what would be is that the Congress and the U.S. government is committed to building the facilities necessary to do this quickly. And so building the facilities that you need and building them quickly and having the money to do that makes total difference in the schedule. So I still have no doubt that if we got that money, we could be doing this in 15, 20 years. But there's also a management issue. Right now in the US, the fusion program is being built uh, is being funded as a science program. And, you know, it's like when we decided to go to the moon, uh, astrophysics was a science program, right? But you had to build up a whole infrastructure and management commitment to go to the moon. And so, you know, what we'd have to get in addition to the money would be a management structure that was committed to getting to a power plant. And, and that is not in the psychology right now of the fusion management at the Department of Energy. So along with the money, I think you would have to either have a whole new agency or you would have to have the Department of Energy set up a whole new wing to make a firm commitment to manage this thing through to the end. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dean. Actually, could we just get the, is it possible to get the end screen up there quickly? There we go want people to be able to contact him. Thank you very much. Our, uh, I was very happy when I heard that our next speaker would be joining us today. Michael Polushek is the president and founder of Princeton Satellite Systems. As you'll hear him mention in his presentation, he and his team are working in collaboration with scientists from the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab on a nuclear fusion system for space propulsion and power generation. And their design has been selected for more than one phase of NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Grant. And one of the things that impressed me when I met Mr. Polushek for the first time was that his team had recently presented a proposal to use their fusion rocket design, not just for interplanetary, but for interstellar exploration. Today, his topic is nuclear fusion propelled missions to Mars. Today we're going to talk about nuclear fusion propelled missions to Mars. Direct Fusion Drive is a nuclear fusion rocket engine for deep space operations. It does not produce enough thrust to take off from a planet or a moon. In this talk, we present a transfer vehicle that uses a high thrust nuclear thermal engine to depart the Earth, that is leave Earth orbit and go into orbit around Mars. We're going to talk about two types of nuclear reactions, fission, which is splitting atoms, and fusion, which is combining atoms. Direct Fusion Drive, or DFD, is a new type of rocket engine made of a fusion reactor powering a plasma rocket. It's different from many other nuclear fusion technologies because this single fusion engine can generate both propulsion and electricity to power its payload. Here's how it works. The DFD engine is made of a linear array of coaxial magnets with a pair of smaller but stronger mirror magnets at the ends. A fusion region is centered within the magnet array while cool plasma flows around it to extract energy. This fusion region is about the length of a surfboard and holds very hot plasma that spins like a motor. Antennas surrounding the engine create a novel radio frequency heating mechanism which is tuned to particular fuel ions and creates a current in the plasma. The plasma ions get pumped up with increasing energy cycles until the ions become hot enough to fuse. Once the ions fuse, they create new, very energetic particles called fusion products. These particles follow paths that take them in and out of the cool plasma layer as they orbit the magnetic field lines. With each pass, the fusion products lose energy until they get captured by the open field lines and shoot out the back of the engine. This takes just a few milliseconds. 
The mirror magnet at the end of the engine converts this electron thermal energy into ion kinetic energy, creating thrust just like a regular rocket nozzle. Extra heat from the fusion reaction is converted into electricity, providing power for scientific instruments and communications. The fuels or reactants used are deuterium and helium-3. The main reaction is deuterium plus helium-3, which produces a helium-4, which is the kind of helium you see in helium balloons, and a proton. Most of the power is in this reaction. We also get side reactions, which produce tritium and neutrons. Neutrons damage the walls, but we fortunately don't have that many of them. This shows you a direct fusion drive engine and its properties. The specific power is a very important parameter because it shows you how much power we get per unit mass, and that's going to determine how good an engine it is. The efficiency is how much power goes from the fusion reaction into the thrust. The fuel tank fraction is particularly important because it ultimately limits how much delta V you can get with a given engine with a given exhaust velocity. You'll notice the exhaust velocity is very high, 300 kilometers a section a second a typical hydrogen oxygen engine like used on a rocket like the space shuttle is about four and a half kilometers per second a hall thruster is 20. the fusion power from a typical engine is one megawatt this shows you the breakdown of the mass for the engine in all these components. To the right is a flow diagram of where the energy is going. So the RMF is a rotating magnetic field. An RF drive drives the fusion reaction, but also waste energy in Bremsstrahlung, which is X-rays, and synchrotron. All this is fed back into the engine, and some is lost as waste heat to the radiator. Now, a fusion engine can get you places a lot faster. We can get the Jupiter in one year, Saturn in two, and Pluto in five. The NASA New Horizon mission took about nine years to get to Pluto, and it couldn't go into orbit. With DFD, we could go into orbit, which enables all sorts of new science. This shows the Mars trajectory for our mission. The blue circle is the Earth, and the red circle is Mars. We depart the Earth and arrive at Mars a short time later. We then wait almost a year on Mars on the surface doing experiments and setting up a new technology and new habitation for future travelers, and then we return to Mars. The whole mission takes very little time, much less than it would if we used a home and transfer, which is what you would do with chemical propulsion. Now, one of the things we're not showing in the diagram is how long it takes to depart from the Earth. We do this in a spiral, and it could take up to 30 days. So one idea is to use a nuclear thermal engine, which produces 10 times the thrust to get us out of Earth orbit. So instead of taking 30 days, it's only slightly more than a half day. On the other hand, because the exhaust velocity is much lower, we consume a lot of hydrogen. You can see on the right a nuclear thermal engine developed by NASA, and its thrust is 7,200 97 newtons, which is quite a lot. The exhaust velocity, however, is only eight and a half kilometers per second, about twice that of the hydrogen oxygen engine that I mentioned a moment ago. So here's the Mars mission. We can get there in 100 days, which is a lot better than the six months that a chemical rocket would take. And you can see we can deliver 30 metric tons. That's, almost, that's about 30 tons. And we show some of the parameters we use in our analysis. Now, we haven't built the engine, so these are hypothetical and based on analysis. But you can see our thrust is much less than that of the nuclear thermal stage. Besides propelling us to and from Mars, we can also use it as a surface power source because direct fusion drive is also being developed for power generation. And the pictures on this page show what it would look like roughly on Mars. Of course, it would have a cover on it. But that shows you about how big it is. And this is the moon, actually. And so you could use this engine to power bases, delivering a megawatt for scientific experiments, manufacturing, mining, and industry on the moon or on Mars. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Dr. Sergei Pulinets, who I want to thank for joining us despite the late hour in Moscow, 
is a principal research scientist on space geophysics at the Space Research Institute at the Russian Academy of Sciences. The title of his presentation is An Approach to the Relationship Between Science and Politics. So thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Pulinets. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Uh, uh, it is a great honor to me to be a participant of this uh, conference, which uh, discuss very important problems for whole humanity. So as a professional space scientist, I would like to start uh, with the uh, space research and uh, specifically uh, about our sun. Uh, we discuss in here how to produce uh, the fusion energy, but uh, we would be able to do if everything will be uh, good with our sun. But we see very strange behavior because uh, in comparison with previous solar cycle where its activity uh, was expressed in uh, 150 20, uh, 200 sunspots. Now, we, uh, the last cycle, uh, during the last cycle, it, the number of sunspots did not exceed 95. There was the weeks uh, where we have no spot on the sun. Uh, usually, the long periods of the decreased solar activity is accompanied uh, by the low temperatures in our planet. And uh, from 1645 to 1715, uh, we observed extremely low temperature all over the world. So uh, now the new solar cycle started and we will observe it it re will return to normal or we could have a cooling instead of the uh, forecast of the global warming. So I would like to welcome the initiative of NASA to start develop developing a new solar project, Heliosworm, which will contain uh, a lot of satellites uh, which will uh, be distributed uh, around the uh, solar uh, um, environment, heliosphere. So, uh, and we uh, even here have heard about uh, the uh, in, uh, that physics are inspired by astrophysical problems, the use of uh, fu uh, fusion to go to Mars, but it seems to me that we should pay more attention to our planet because uh, we have a very dangerous tendency that countries ignore agreements of the peaceful uh, use of space and begin to organize the space commands, space weapons and system for their use and uh, start to put in orbit the weapons. So uh, we can finish uh, very fast uh, <laughs> with our civilization because we lower the threshold to the world war. The second problem, it is a climate change. And uh, connected with this, the space research, uh, which we conducted. We have a lot of satellites, but scientists cannot explain the increasing number of uh, natural disasters. Uh, and it is because all the sciences are separated by very specialized, uh, specialized uh, their own field, atmosphere, ionosphere, uh, thermodynamics and do not take into account the very important things. It is 
looking at our planet and our environment uh, as a whole. Uh, we need the holistic approach to see on the interaction between the geospheres, uh, which uh, was discussed by academician Vernadsky and Laverov, uh, to resolve the problem of changing of our environment. And specifically, I would like to stop in one problem from uh, um, connected with the nature of disasters. It is a, a prediction of the earthquakes. We developed the technology and demonstrated that it works. Uh, it was proved on uh, all the highest scientific forums. We have patents of the USA and Russia. We negotiated with the Minister of Emergencies in Russia, FEMA in the United States, in Japan. But uh, the problem not is put forward. It's, it, it dies uh, like a water uh, in sand. And uh, in this case, we can state that it, it is not a problem of science. It is solved, but it is a relationship between the science and politics. It looks that uh, the politics do not want to resolve this problem uh, and uh, all the earthquakes finishing by the heroically pulled to remains out from under the rubble. Uh, we should put forward to resolve this problem. Um, the next thing I would like to touch, it is a green energy. Uh, we see great enthusiasm about the electromobiles, that uh, they will improve the air quality in our cities, and so on, so on. But let us think from where these vehicles take their electricity. This electricity still produced the, by, by the uh, stations, uh, electric power plants, which use the coil, oil, uh, and uh, other uh, sources uh, used by thermal electro power plants. Taking into account that efficiency of the transfer of energy starting from its producing to charging the uh, accumulators in these vehicles, much less the unit. So to produce this electricity for these accumulators for the electric cars, uh, we uh, produce more carbon dioxide uh, in comparison uh, with uh, if we used the normal combustion engine. Another problem of this, that uh, ac accumulators on these cars use such metals as lithium and cobalt and uh, which are not so ab abundant on our planet. Uh, for example, in Chile, to get this lithium from mines, it uses almost 65% of the wa water resources of the Salar de Atacama region, which is the driest desert region in the world. And uh, in, in, in that we pollute the environment there, and uh, the United Nations Children's Fund reports that about 20% of the cobalt supplied from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo uh, used the children labor, uh, which uh, work in very bad conditions. And if we calculate how we will save if we use these electric cars, uh, how many uh, carbon dioxide uh, will be saved and how uh, it will influence on the temperature on our planet. If it grows number of these cars 15 times, it will save again only uh, a hundred thousands of a degree Celsius, 
So 0 0.00018 degrees of Celsius. So it saves nothing. Uh, if we talked, uh, we'll talk about another sources of green energy, like uh, uh, solar panels, wind generators. They all depend on the nature. We should have the independent sources of the energy, because uh, now in situation of the United States, uh, where the low wind they have fires and there is not enough electric energy in California uh, from the wind generation. For example, if you speak about solar batteries, if you are in desert, they could be covered by the sand and uh, you use effectiveness of this. So uh, the uh, fusion probably it is the hope for the humanity to uh, have the independent and clear source of energy but we heard from the uh, previous presentations that the first plasma will be uh, given only uh, on uh, 2025 but from this the way to the uh, global distribution of this uh, nuclear energy uh, is very long. And I suppose that uh, we can use in this time span until ITER will, in, will be converted to the real pro production of the uh, energy to the whole humanity. We can use the reactors on the fast neutrons which are uh, do not uh, produce the vast of the uh, radioactive materials so it uh, could be uh, the way to uh, increase production of energy and this will be the clear energy so uh, our conference is taking place in a time when humanity is passing a turning point in its development and we see the very high level of turbulence. We are uh, many countries are now in the critical point. And main thing in such circumstances is making correct and balanced decisions. It's not enough to pro propose the different measures but we still need to convey the people convey this information to as many inhabitants of our planet as possible because only then they can be implemented and let me wish us all the best in achieving this noble goal thank you very much for your intention Thank you very much, Dr. Pulinets. Our next speaker is Paul Dreesen. Mr. Dreesen is the Senior Policy Advisor to the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. He is the author of the book, Eco-Imperialism, Green Power, Black Death. And his presentation to us today is called, Will We Allow Eco-Imperialism to Block Development? Hello everyone. I'm sorry I can't join you live, but I do want to share some important thoughts with you about lethal eco-imperialist policies that are being imposed on billions of poor people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America by rich, powerful, callous radicals in developed countries. The chasm between modern industrialized nations and still impoverished countries is as shocking as it is unnecessary and intolerable. But the reasons for that chasm, and what can and must be done to eliminate it, are readily available for anyone who wants to discover them, for anyone who wants to use that knowledge to dramatically improve lives and living standards in all those still impoverished countries. These countries need freedom to function, create, and build responsibly, 
under reasonable, responsible laws and regulations. They need to eradicate diseases that kill people and make them unable to work for weeks or even months. To do that, they need doctors, nurses, modern clinics and hospitals, clean water, insecticides, medicines, homes and buildings with doors and window screens to keep disease-carrying insects out. They need abundant, nutritious food through modern agriculture and the seeds and other technologies that produce more crops from less land, using less water, with less back-breaking labor, and are able to survive locust and other insect plagues. Perhaps more than anything else, they need energy, especially electricity, abundant, reliable, affordable energy from coal, natural gas, nuclear, and hydroelectric sources. Expensive, intermittent, unreliable, insufficient energy from millions of wind turbines, billions of solar panels, and billions of backup batteries requires a hundred times more raw materials, mining, land use, habitat destruction, and wildlife decimation than those now hated coal, gas, nuclear, and hydroelectric sources. Each of these steps and components creates jobs, incomes, prosperity, health, and better, more productive lives that multiply and multiply over time. In fact, all these things are fundamental human rights. I'm talking about the fundamental human right of access to these modern technologies, the fundamental right for all human lives to be improved and blessed the way ours have been. The fundamental human right to never be denied access to these technologies. So what's holding these impoverished nations back? Inertia and inaction? Sure. Corruption? Certainly. But there's another factor, a dark and evil force throwing roadblocks in their way. That dark evil force is the veritable army of rich, powerful government agencies and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, that lie, pressure, harass, and intimidate families, businesses, and entire countries into doing nothing, into rejecting modern technologies, into settling for minuscule improvements in their lives and living standards, and only at the margins. These pressure groups use their vast wealth, prestige, power, and control over trade loans and technology transfers to perpetuate poverty, disease, malnutrition, and death. It's eco-manslaughter. And yet, they get lionized and even canonized for supposedly protecting Mother Earth. The NGOs enjoy tax-exempt status and global prestige because the horrific human and environmental costs of their actions are mostly ignored by news media, celebrity, human rights, and other supposed watchdogs. Maybe even worse, they're financed by taxpayers and by wealthy, super wealthy, in fact, supposedly charitable foundations, many of which got their billions of dollars from fortunes made in the same industries and technologies that they now deny to poor families and countries. What they are doing is akin to denying cancer patients access to chemotherapy because they are concerned about possible side effects. They would rather see the patients die than allow them to suffer hair loss or depressed immune systems, as though it's their decision instead of the cancer patients. But it's even worse, because the supposed side effects of the modern technologies that these powerful NGOs, government agencies, and international anti-development banks are denying to impoverished families and countries are mostly exaggerated, or fabricated. They exist in their imaginations, computer models, press releases, and fundraising appeals, not in reality. These pressure groups won't even let families get golden rice, which could prevent 500,000 children from going blind and 250,000 children from dying every single year from vitamin A deficiency and malnutrition. These radical agencies, foundations, banks, and NGOs are committing crimes against humanity. They are perpetrating and perpetuating millions of deaths every year, 
millions of poor, dead, dark-skinned parents and children at the hands of mostly rich, white radicals in wealthy, developed countries. These cold-blooded eco-imperialists should be condemned for crimes against humanity and racist eco-manslaughter. They should lose their funding and tax-exempt status. They should be banned from college campuses and polite civil society. They should be hauled before the UN Human Rights Commission and International Court of Justice. All of you at this conference could help make that happen. You could turn this dark evil paradigm on its head. You could help bring a new birth of freedom, health, and prosperity to dozens of countries and billions of people around the world. I hope you'll join me and my colleagues in making it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dreesen. Our next speaker will be Dr. Kelvin Kem, but before we get to Dr. Kem, we first have a greeting that was sent to this conference by the leader of LaRouche, South Africa, Philip Tsokolabane, whose message is entitled, LaRouche and the Development of Africa. My name is Ramasimum Philip Tsokodibane. I am proud to be the leader of the LaRouche movement in South Africa. On behalf of my nation and all of Africa, I send greetings to each and every participant in this urgently important conference and pray for the success of our deliberations. When I spoke to you last May, I urged that the greatest powers devise plans to send immediate and massive aid to my country and all of Africa to help us overcome the ongoing global coronavirus pandemic. I ask that President Trump make good on his promise to stand by Africa and do all that he could sec to secure a better life for Africans through economic development aimed at lifting our people out of poverty. This sentiment was communicated by First Lady Melania Trump in her October 2018 tour of several African nations focusing on the plight of our children. There have been reports in the international press that the pandemic may have spared many Africans, pointing to lower than expected official infection and death rates, including in my own country. I believe that the official numbers are vastly understated because of the severe lack of viable health care systems and the absence of testing. As that great lady, Chile Institute Chairwoman Helga Zeplarus has said, we must build up an extensive, modern, worldwide health security system as no such system currently exists. This applies to much of the so-called advanced sector, including in the United States. It is certainly true in Africa. We need more doctors. We need more health care workers. We need more hospital beds and treatment facilities. We need access to medicines and personal protective equipment. And when developed, we will need access to vaccines and antiviral therapies. We cannot pay for this we should not be asked to do so we need a special global health civilian conservation core type program to help us accomplish this as helga proposes and we needed this yesterday the reason we now we know that the numbers of covid cases are estimated is simple we know that the main vector in the spread of disease is poverty. Africa, in a state of enforced underdevelopment imposed by the global British financial empire, suffers from widespread poverty. So this virus is killing Africans in large numbers, even as we speak today. We cannot allow this condition to stand. This must be among the urgent matters to be discussed 
at the summit of the Permanent Five United Nations Security Council. Member nations proposed for next month by Russian President Vladimir Putin. That summit must take place. I call again on President Trump, make good on your promise to help Africans. As I look at the anger and frustration in the streets and cities of America today, I see many rallying around the slogan, Black Lives Matter, but there's not a black life threatened with death through poverty and disease in Africa or anywhere else, oppressed by a global financial oligarchy that seeks death for those they consider useless eaters. Matter just as much as a life threatened by the armed brutality of police. I hear nothing about that from my black brothers and sisters in the United States. All citizens everywhere in the world, we must join together and express with equal clarity and certainty our moral courage, outrage at the murderous intent of Wall Street and City of London bankers, whose policies kill Africans, and the outrageous and acceptable actions taken by police in America. I appeal to what your greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, called the better angels of our nature, to find the pathway for justice for all men, for all women, for all humanity. I believe that pathway for justice is embodied in the policies of Lyndon LaRouche to create a just new world economic order that would give all of us the opportunity to rise to an creative potential as human beings. In our pursuit of that happy future, I foresee success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsokalibane. Um, he will be joining us live for Q&A as well. Our final speaker is Dr. Kelvin Kem. Uh, Dr. Kem is the CEO of Straytech Business Strategy Consultants. He is the former board chairman of the South African Nuclear Energy Corporation. And his topic today is nuclear energy in South Africa and in Africa at large. I am Dr. Kelvin Kim. I'm a nuclear physicist from Pretoria in South Africa, from the company Stratic Business Strategy Consultants. And I do work over a wide ranging number of fields, not only in the nuclear, but all sorts of businesses where we have to look at solutions that work for us, for us people who live in Africa. Believe it or not, but Africa is larger than the United States, China, Europe, India, and Japan added together. South Africa alone is the same size as the whole of Western Europe. And the distance from where I live in Pretoria to Cape Town at the southern point of the country is the same distance as Rome to London. And we often find when we are traveling in Europe and we talk to Europeans and they talk about something being a long way away, they mean 100 kilometers. We think nothing of driving 100 kilometers to a meeting and then driving back. To us, a long way is 500 kilometers or more. So we have to think, how do we find solutions that work for Africa? So many of the European solutions are assumed to work. And we in Africa are very guilty of this ourselves. We hear somebody saying, there's a television system, there's a telephone system, there's a so-and-so system that we wish to import. And uh, so we say to ourselves, oh, well, uh, let's have a look. It's working in Germany or it's working in France or Switzerland. But then we discover the distances for them are 20 kilometers between radio masts or something. Whereas for us, it's got to be 200 kilometers or more for it to work in the same way. So quite often we've got to look and say, what is it that we must do? And the challenge is to start thinking for yourself and thinking under your own conditions. We build dams here in South Africa and dams that hold drinking water. 
and the dams are designed to last through a five-year drought. In the UK, if it doesn't rain for a couple of weeks, they start to worry about drought conditions and water shortages. Yeah, it's years that the dams are designed for. So the nature of the approach is just very different. Many people from the first world are going to many African countries and telling them wind and solar is the answer because it looks like it works in my country in Europe. And that is a dishonest thing to do. One needs to look and say, how would Zambia, Botswana, the Congo, Mozambique, and so on satisfy their electricity needs? And what is really beneficial for them? South Africa is predominantly dependent on coal for power. We're one of the few countries in the world that is blessed with vast coal reserves, which we use for our own electricity, but we export a lot of coal too. But the coal is all clustered in the northeast of the country. And as I indicated, the distance from where the coal is, which is further away from the south than Pretoria is, the distance from the coal to Cape Town, so to speak, is like Rome to London. It's not practical to move the electricity all that way. That's why the Kuburg nuclear power station 50 years ago was conceived of as being down in the south. And Kuburg is nearly 40 years old now and has about 50 years of life behind it, we think, so it's got a good number of years to go. But we have plans now to build more nuclear power stations around the coastline of the southern part of the country. The coastline, because number one, that's where we need the electricity to come up from the south, and also because the sea is there to provide large-scale cooling for a big nuclear power station. But nuclear power is the answer for most of Africa, if not all of Africa. Not necessarily big 3,000 megawatt power stations, but for example, small power stations like the South African plans to develop what was known as the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor, the PBMR, which is 100 to 200 megawatts in size versus the Kuburg size station, which is 2,000 megawatts in size. The pebble bed reactor was designed by South Africans in South Africa to take into account our conditions. For example, it was designed to not need a large body of water cooling, so it is cooled by gas. So it can be placed inland where some of the mining activities are, some of the huge mining activities that need a lot of power. Why not put a nuclear reactor close to the mines? The South African mines underground have hundreds of kilometers of road underground. There's shops underground, there's education facilities for the workers, there's trains that go past and so on. So a lot of power is used in these mines. If one looks at other African countries, they all need nuclear power. And a number of African leaders have spoken to me personally and indicated that that's exactly what they need because the majority of African countries are not blessed with fossil fuels. They don't have large reserves of coal or gas or oil. So they need the electricity. Electricity is what advances people. It's just not honest for some of these extreme green people to come along and say, you're doing the right thing. You're carrying water from the river in a bucket. That is the way to continue living in harmony with nature. I've had some of these Europeans telling me that type of thing to my face. Or to say to a person, you're using a wooden plow powered by one ox. That is the right thing to do. Do not invest in a tractor because then you need fuel and you'll have oil and you'll have gaseous pollution. That's just not right. So we've got to look at what is the real solutions for South Africa as an economics leader of the, of the continent, but also then for the rest of Africa as well, right the way past the equator up to the north. And numbers of African countries have already indicated that they want to go nuclear. Countries like Zambia have started with a project to build their first um, nuclear reactor that will be used for training and purposes. And other countries have indicated they're doing the same. Further to the north, Egypt and so on have started with nuclear power and so on. So I've got no doubt you're going to see a lot more in the future. But nuclear power is one aspect of nuclear technology. There's much more than that. 
for example, nuclear medicine. South Africa has become a world leader in nuclear medicine, and we now export nuclear medicine to over 60 countries worldwide. Nuclear medicine is wonderful. It's used primarily as a diagnostic at the moment. It's by far the best way to detect cancer and some other diseases as well. It's as simple as being injected with uh, the nuclear tracer that goes into the body and then is designed to gravitate towards the cancer. There's various formulations and the medical doctors know which ones to use depending on what they're looking for. And the nuclear medicine will then show very early on whether the person has cancer or certain other things. Far sooner than many normal diagnostic methods will ever detect. Bearing in mind the large distances that I've already mentioned, it's possible to put up nuclear scanning centers way out in rural areas, far away, and have somebody like a nurse present to be able to do the scanning. It is not necessary to have a medical doctor at each one of those scanning sites. They are all then linked via internet to centers where there are trained medical doctors trained in the field that can then give the diagnosis. So it's possible, for example, to have a scanning center in Tanzania or in Uganda or in Kenya or in Botswana and have somebody scanned there and instantaneously have the scan sent through to Cape Town or Pretoria to be diagnosed and then the answer sent back to the medical doctor in Uganda or Tanzania, for argument's sake, who's treating the patient, and then work from there. Of course, what is desirable is for African countries to train their own nuclear professionals. Many people already exist in African countries, but there's huge potential for many more. Uh, there are training programs in South Africa and Pretoria, for example, and we already have um, African trainees on the program, radiographers and uh, medical doctors from other countries. So this opportunity for Africa to become a world leader in nuclear medicine, which we already are in the distribution from South Africa, and South Africa could supply the nuclear medicine to anybody who needs it. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. So now we are in our question and answer period. And before we bring our entire panel up on the screen here, I just want to tell people if you have a question for any of our panelists, you can send it to questions at schillerinstitute.org. So we've had a lot of questions come in, some very detailed, some more general um, on all of the topics that have been raised. But I would first like to give our panel a chance to respond to anything that they've heard so far um, raised by the other presenters. So why don't we begin with Jason and see if you have anything you'd like to, to say in response. Well, just that I thought that this was a really profoundly inspiring image of the future that we have gotten from the expertise that is here on nuclear power, on fusion nuclear power, on space science, um, so I think that this is, I, I saw in the YouTube chat, people were saying, wow, why didn't I know about this? Why isn't this the top thing on the news when they heard about how huge ITER is and about the international cooperation that makes it possible, which is, uh, you know, that's a very good question. Um, I sort of just actually had a question for some of the other speakers, which maybe we can take up now or later, which was, you know, to what extent fusion um, is an engineering versus a, a science problem? Uh, that is, you know, to what extent do unexpected outcomes in fusion experiments create the next generation of fusion experiments? When we create these, you know, tokamaks or these other devices, how much of what happens is a surprise to us versus how much is what we would expect and confirming uh, our, the knowledge that we already have. So that's, that's what I have on my mind. Dr. Bigot, would you like to answer Jason's question? And then of course, anything you'd like to raise? Pretty much, I just unmute my phone. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, certainly I believe that uh, the development of uh, hydrogen fusion from my point of view is both 
the scientific and engineering uh, issue. Um, as you know, we have to assemble all these components in very, very precise condition. It has never been done before. So really, engineering uh, is a capability is absolutely decisive, certainly. But as you know, we are exploring, I would say, terra incognita. Never in on the world, somebody has been able to have a, what we call a burning plasma, a self-sustained plasma, 150 million degrees, and uh, it will be some turbulence, it will be some uh, different uh, ev events. We know they would exist, but uh, we are never experienced at this scale. So from my point of view, is both, okay, the need for science development as well as for engineering. Um, Dr. Dean, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, thanks, Bernard. Uh, we all admire you all over the world for the job you are doing on this incredibly large, complex construction project. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to uh, the day when we're actually studying the plasma. I would just add, uh, perhaps or expand on what Bernard was saying, fusion and fusion science and engineering is in many ways not uh, dissimilar from the history of, of uh, science and engineering and technology over hundreds of years. You know, we're at the very early stages of learning how to do this. And you have to expect that the first thing that we do is not going to be the last thing that we do in terms of improvements and finding new ways to do it and finding new understandings and 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 so on and so forth so when ITER operates and when fusion is really uh there in the laboratory it's really the beginning of probably a couple of hundred years worth of uh things that you can't even hardly imagine just like you can't hardly even imagine our cell phones today a <laughs> hundred years ago great um would anyone else on the panel care to respond to anything that's been said before we go to questions? If so, just raise your hand to indicate. Yes, Dr. Kim. I think it's important to note the advance that's being taken in uh, nuclear developments, the fusion machines, the advanced tokamaks, the space engines that are going to enable us maybe um, to get to Mars. Would anyone else on the panel care to respond to anything that's been said before we go to questions? If so, just raise your hand to indicate. Yes, Dr. Kim. Go ahead, Dr. Kim. We um, can hear you. There's, there's great advances being made in nuclear and the far advanced nuclear, that is the fusion and so on. In the meantime, a lot of work has been done on things like small modular reactors, advanced generation three plus reactors and so on and there mustn't be breaks put on the development of these nuclear solutions and their deployment into countries like african countries Go ahead, Dr. Kim, I'll you. okay and what i noted with what dr Poulinet said as well is that we've got to look at our planet now we've got to look at a lot of the politics of society there's Potential global cooling is coming, with which I agree, it's indicated by the sunspot activity. But what we're finding is that there's psychological and social pressure being exerted to put in wind and solar as a response to supposedly saving the planet from carbon dioxide. And yet indications are that the little bit of global warming that has been detected since the, the time of uh, President Abraham Lincoln is probably due to magnetic activity on the sun and is not actually to due to human induced carbon dioxide at all. What? So we've got to look at that and say, scientists have got to much more get in contact with uh, society at large. And we need to get the politicians to listen and we need to try to be realistic. Now, this is very difficult. Dr. Pulines pointed out these moves towards electric vehicles, for example. And quite correctly, to my mind, said it'll probably produce more CO2 to produce the electric vehicle than to just use the petrol. There's also the sociological effects of children being used in the lithium mines, the cobalt mines, and so on.
and this is not noticed. Paul Dreesen made uh, mention of this, of the chasm between rich countries and other countries. And it's just not reasonable for African countries to be told they've got to stay in an archaic state because somebody in the first world thinks they've got an answer which probably is suspect anyway, this carbon dioxide argument. And he made it quite clear that people are not realizing what's going on. Uh, the death rate from malaria, for example, is high in Africa because DDT is being blocked from being used. There's a lot of human cost going on. So we somehow need politics and we need sociology and we need people like the bankers to be pay more attention to scientists the scientists may be able to speak their language and explain to them what it is that we need. There are nuclear solutions along the way, and I feel that the, the fusion research is at the, at the leading edge at the moment, but trailing behind that is the practical solutions that can be employed today, such as pebble bed sub reactors, gas cooled reactors that are ideal for deployment in African countries and many other countries around the world, in fact, as well. So I think it's impossible. It's very important to listen to Dr. Poulinet's arguments about the politics and the sociology and science coming together to find adequate solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I heard we were just getting a bit of an audio feedback. I think, um, Dr. Kim, you just have to mute your uh, speakers on what you're listening to. I think we were getting some feedback from that. Um, and I also know that uh, we did have a question come in on the pebble bed reactor, which I'll get to in a little while here. Um, I just want to see if Sergei Pulinets, if you have anything you'd like to add in response to any of the other panelists so far. Uh, yes, um, um, I'm happy that uh, what I am talking about, I found uh, the common uh, language which representatives from Africa, which demonstrated that a traditional source for energy and more is are now more convenient and more effective than wind and solar panel generators. And uh, I forgot uh, to tell that if we will look in the uh, total uh, cycle of uh, mining of the metals for the uh, ac accumulators for cars, uh, the, uh, then we should uh, think on the utilization. You, we know that all the small batteries which we have in our phones uh, could not utilized with the normal vast. We should give them to special places. And now imagine how large technology we need to utilize these accumulator batteries from these cars, electric cars. Uh, it, it is necessary as a, as a special industry for utilization of these accumulators. And uh, uh, the number of this car is growing uh, in geometrical uh, extent. And it will con uh, create uh, the large problem for the environment. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Polushek, I know you weren't able to join us uh, until recently. Do you have anything you would like to say in response so far? Oh, I'm so, I think your microphone's muted. How's that? Oh, that's much better. Yeah, no, no, I've been, I enjoy listening to all the speakers. Great, wonderful. Okay, oh, and I'm sorry, and Philip Tsokalibane, is there anything you would like to add at this point? His microphone might still be muted. Okay, maybe um, we'll come back to Philip. I'll take a question first and then check in. So as I said, we've had many, many questions come in. Um, the first one I'd like to ask is for Dr. Bigot. 
And the questioner asks, with the beginning of the assembly phase of ITER this summer, French President Macron made a speech in which he said, there are times when the peoples and countries of the world choose to overcome their differences, to rise to the historical challenge of their times. And the launch of ITER, of the ITER project, is one of such moments. ITER is a promise of peace. From your perspective, Dr. Bigot, what does Macron mean that ITER is a promise of peace? Indeed, we were very pleased to see on the 28th of July uh, when we invite the seven head of state of the seven ITER members to express their view on ITER and as well on the signification of this uh, start of the assembling phase. President Macron stated very clearly that uh, the world uh, uh, needs energy. Energy is life. Without energy, no biological life, neither okay, economical life or social life and development. And so now, as you know, the world energy supply is not so well distributed. Okay, you have some countries which have quite uh, favorable um, resources uh, of fossil fuels. Some other are quite favorable condition for renewable energies, but uh, uh, many of them have difficulties in order to ensure for the long term their uh, world, their energy supply, national energy supply. And uh, fusion uh, is using raw material indeed, as you know, it is water and a very tiny quantity of lithium, which are largely distributed. And so we could avoid to have this competition and even maybe sometimes uh, uh, wars Hello? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, and there is many uh, competition and confrontation uh, in the history where people try to, to, to um, okay, um, get uh, energy from uh, some other part of the world. So it was the reason why he said that if we develop hydrogen fusion and have it as it is now decided, uh, fully share among all the people, as uh, maybe you notice uh, the, what we call the intellectual property and know-how will be fully distributed within all the ITER members and more broadly, it could be a very uh, breakthrough for a long-term peaceful time for the world. It, I, I understand properly the meaning of President Macron's statement. Thank you. Uh, our next question, if I can pull it up here, is um, on proton-boron fusion. So it's a little bit specific. And I would invite Dr. Bigot and Dr. Dean, and of course anyone else to respond. So the questioner says, uh, Dr. Bigot, my name is Armin Azima, a physicist at the University of Hamburg. The company LPP Fusion and in New Jersey has built a Z-pinch fusion reactor, which can ignite the DD as well as the aneutronic PB11, the hydrogen boron 11 fusion reaction. Recently, a new, um, aneutronic fusion energy output of 0.1 joule per shot was achieved there. This reactor is now only about four orders of magnitude below the break-even point. This progress has been achieved at a cost of $7 million within 12 years. Are you familiar with this technology? And what do you think about the approach to build a two cubic meter small, but therefore only one megawatt strong fusion reactor based on aneutronic fusion and direct fusion to electricity energy conversion, in particular using the proton boron 11 reaction? So it's a little specific, but okay. hopefully you caught his Yes, his very gist. specific, and maybe Steve Dean also could uh, bring some uh, okay, comment on this matter. So uh, definitely, uh, as I said, we need to uh, have an alternative option for the fossil fuel. And many uh, innovative uh, uh, research effort has been done all over the world, and uh, this example is a very good one. From my point of view, uh, it is worth 
to, to try, and uh, I am very pleased to know that they are progressing quite well. From my point of view, uh, there is uh, some physics limits which uh, prevent uh, easy use uh, of this type of technologies, but why not don't try? You know, I am, I am a scientist, and uh, always you have to consider that there could be a, a real uh, science breakthroughs, engineering breakthrough, which could add a lot of uh, added value. So from my point of view, uh, I just encourage this type of initiative. From the point of view of ITER, it's good. Uh, ITER, whatever uh, this uh, um, smaller device could do, will provide us for the first time the demonstration of uh, what is a self-sustained plasma, a burning plasma, producing minimum 10 times more heat that you feed in this plasma. So it will bring a lot of new knowledge. And I do believe it will be very useful in any case, whatever the fusion technology will be at the end, the winner. Conversely, if this uh, uh, small uh, devices and technology with these boron okay, fuels demonstrate its feasibility, maybe it could bring also added value for the ITER project on itself. So they are not concurrent for me, they are complementary. Steve, would you like to add anything? Well, all I can tell you is that whoever told this questioner all of those accomplishments that he just enumerated is selling that person the, Bro the Brooklyn Bridge. None of those things has been accomplished there and none of them will be accomplished in anybody's lifetime. Uh, the things that he described are just totally impossible to do at that scale. Would you like to say anything about the specific company he's referring to, uh, the company in New Jersey? I know them well. <laughs> and I can tell you that they have not done any of those things that the questioner thinks they have done. Got it. Okay, our next question is on space, and I'm going to ask um, Mr. Polushek to respond first. The question is from a science professor at a college in New Jersey. And this person asks, we have already employed fission in space missions. Besides propulsion, what other uses would fusion bring to our spacefaring society? For example, could fusion aid in in situ resource utilization? The uh, fusion can be used just like fission for both power generation and propulsion. Uh, fission is interesting because one option for fission propulsion is nuclear thermal. We can get fairly high thrust. A fusion typically is going to produce much uh, the technology we've looked into is produce much lower thrust, so it's only really suitable for in space and fairly slow missions. But in both cases, both type of reactors can be used for Mars bases or lunar bases. NASA is pursuing fission right now because the technology has been developed to a fairly high level of development in the Kilopar program. Fusion is quite a bit off in terms of time you're talking about you know, 15, 20 years before you could use fusion technology for the same kind of thing. So I imagine that the first application of nuclear power in space will be either nuclear electric, which is being proposed for some missions, or also as a power for bases on the moon or Mars. Would anyone else like to respond, Jason? Oh, you're muted, Jason. One thing on resource utilization that comes to mind is about how both fission and fusion differ from using chemical power or uh, solar power, which is what you would have on another planet. And that's the, uh, the processing of materials. So if we're trying to uh, essentially use the crust of the moon or Mars and extract the resources from it, um, it's difficult to pull metals apart from oxygen that's combined with them chemically. Here on Earth, we use coal to do that, both to provide the heat and the carbon 
is able to pull out the oxygen to form carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. We're not going to be using carbon for that purpose uh, on another celestial body. And having a very intense supply of energy means that it's possible to find other ways of separating uh, the metals from oxygen uh, so that we could more effectively you know, make use of that on, on, another, on another celestial body. Okay, our next question is for Dr. Kim. Um, the questioner asks, had fusion been available as a power source by the 1990s, what do you think the population of the planet and the continent of Africa might be by now? Dr. Kim, could you? Sorry, could you just repeat that? Um, we can we can sort of hear you. Yes, go ahead. I'm getting a bit of an echo, but I think you have to mute your speakers. We're getting a bit of a feedback. It seems to be coming from your speakers. Do you want to try one more time, and then maybe we can try to fix it and 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 come back? Okay. I don't know what's happening. I've been hearing an echo all of the time. So I, don't know. I think I think the signal is coming over here through the satellite and through the K undersea cable. Okay. Is that? Are you still getting the echo? <sighs> okay. Uh, sorry, I'll have to ask you to repeat that question. Sure. Let's let's try, and then maybe. Um... We can try to fix it before the next one. The question is, had fusion been available as a power source by the 1990s, what do you think the population of the planet and the continent of Africa might be by now? Um, no, I don't need that. Um, I, t I think with, with fusion, fusion has been a goal for a long, long time. Sure. Okay, I think we have to maybe pause and come back, and um, hopefully we can solve solve the audio problem there because we would definitely like to get your response on this. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to respond to that question before we move on? If I may, you see uh, the development in Africa everywhere in the world is definitely depending of energy in order to develop, for example, hospital and medical and so. So I am pretty sure that uh, if uh, there were easy, safe, clean energy in Africa uh, everywhere in the world, okay, the development of Africa would have been much uh, safer and uh, more, uh, much more steady. But uh, it's very difficult to predict what would be the population because it depends mainly on, uh, on, on, on uh, the development, education, and also individual behavior. My understanding that uh, uh, it would have been a much safer development if they had okay, more reliable source of energies. Okay, our next question concerns space travel. The questioner asks, how can we go to Mars or even to the moon when we're facing a major constraint, which is to be able to cross the Van Allen radiation belts. So who would like to take that up? Uh, it's, uh, the problem Jason. of the... Uh, But uh, we can select the trajectory of space vehicle uh, to uh, pass in uh, the polar regions uh, where the uh, magnetic field lines go inside the magnetosphere in between them, uh, we can uh, send our space vehicle 
essentially uh, uh, this was the way how Apollo missions uh, were sent to the moon. So, uh, yes, radiation belts, it is a problem, but it is possible to select the special trajectory uh, of the space vehicle to avoid uh, the uh, threat to the astronauts. Okay, this next question is for Dr. Bigot. The questioner says, as you mentioned, various partner nations' contributions to ITER are in the form of manufactured components, such as magnetic coils, vacuum vessel pieces, and so forth. Today, there seems to be a trend of placing sanctions on companies from some of the nations involved in ITER. Has this impacted ITER? And if so, how have you dealt with it? It's a very good question indeed. Uh, as you know, the seven partners of 35 different countries has agreed to join their efforts because they know there is no alternative option for them to develop fusion. And I am very pleased to say that this, since I am involved in the ITER project, Whatever the other political debates happen on the, uh, among the members, uh, ITER has not been impacted. Okay, they all realize that yes, they have to, to, to preserve fairness between them in order to succeed. So for the time being, I have not experienced any difficulty about what you said about the banning of some company. So far, it never happened and work has been going on the best way. That's good news. Um, so we have- If an... I may, you know, yeah. if I may, you know, the ITER project is a good illustration that when there is a common understanding among all the nation and the political leaders, that there is no alternate option for them to join their effort sincerely okay works could be done and we it's from my point of view a good example for many other issues we are as the world is facing about okay uh, uh, food about okay uh, uh, medicals uh, uh, disease and all these things so uh, i i i would say pray for to uh, preserve this type of cooperation uh, in some uh, uh, in ITER, but as well in many other okay, different uh, field. Uh, uh, Sergey, are you responding? You're you're muted. Relation. Ah, uh, could what? you start over? Yes, uh, that all the time the, the scientific cooperation prevents the military conflicts. Uh, we can remember the Soyuz Apollo uh, common uh, space uh, project between the United States and uh, Soviet Union. And uh, now we are working on the, uh, many countries working on the uh, 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 medical vaccine uh, against the COVID and so on. So uh, it is very nice that we have the large scientific project which unites different uh, nations, even if they have some conflicts in different issues, for example, China and India, and so on, so on. Thank you very much. So we have a question which is directed toward Dr. Dean, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Pulinets. So I'll let you decide what order to go in. The, questions, uh, the question is, what about a 15-year program for building a, a new design for a nuclear fission plant, including pebble bed and thorium designs, moving to fission-fusion hybrids, and then fusion? at the point of feasibility. As better technologies come online, we discard the old, but we evolve from fossil fuels as much as we can. 
We can, if we wish, use as much oil or coal as we want because we have a vision of where we are going. So why don't we start with you, Dr. Dean? Well, I think the track that uh, the, the development track that uh, you just described is a possible track, uh, except for the last point you, uh, you mentioned, which is, well, we can then use as much uh, fossil fuels as we want because we have a, a carbon problem into the atmosphere that needs to be dealt with uh, in the next several, several decades. But in terms of the technology path of going, uh, coupling fission and fusion, uh, and then go on from there to pure fusion, that is definitely a possible development track. It is not a track that uh, either fission people or fusion people seem to be uh, pushing for. <laughs> they each like their own separate tracks, but uh, it has definitely been looked at from time to time, and it is definitely technically a track that could be followed. Okay, Dr. Kim, why don't we try and see if our audio problem is solved? Oh, it seems not. Okay, we're going to keep trying to solve that. And in the meantime, um, go to Dr. Pulinets. Okay, um, as I told in, in my presentation, uh, I think uh, that uh in addition to development of the uh, traditional uh, nuclear power plants uh, you probably know that in russia uh, we developed uh, the reactors uh, on fast neutrons so the advantage of these reactors that uh, they can uh, to use all radioactive elements which are remains after the first uh, reaction. So there is no vast after uh, elaboration all the products inside this reactor. So it is completely pure technology. And before uh, we reach essential results on uh, fusion, we can use uh, instead these reactors on the fast neutrons. Great. Would anyone else like to respond to that question before we move on? Okay. Uh, now we have a question specifically on the ITER design. The question is, how does the increase in scale change the internal plasma confinement geometry of the fusion reaction? Does the ITER design take the unknown variables of this very complex process into account? Okay, the um, ITER design indeed has been developed uh, during nearly 15 years. Uh, when the, based on the decision of uh, President Reagan and uh, Secretary Gorbachev to launch a large international research cooperation has been decided. And so the physicists, based on the many years of uh, experience, uh, including in the, in the, in the US uh, as well as in uh, Europe, uh, Tokamak, they have decided to shape uh, the plasma indeed has a D shape as we as we know which uh, would offer the best uh, stability as well as the best way to collect energy so from my point of view uh, for for a large plasma uh, like uh, the eater one uh, nearly okay as uh, I saw I uh, uh, mentioned it was uh, over 800 f uh, cubic meter this shape is very well suited on some other design, maybe the shape could be different. Okay, there is not a single uh, okay way to proceed. But from my point of view, this uh, selected shape for uh, the ITER tokamak is appropriate for the size we have right now. Steve, maybe or Steve, else? then oh. yes. <laughs> 
No, I think, uh, you know, there's something called eater scaling <laughs> that was developed over the years from dozens of tokamaks of various sizes. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of backup from a lot of experiments uh, from small to larger tokamaks that have gone into the optimization of the eater, eater geometry. And if I may comment, you know, we are uh, lucky enough now to have what we call the modeling simulation. We could with the large computer and uh, the appropriate okay, uh, software model very well okay, the plasma behavior. And so far with this modeling, nobody has found a better shape for the eater than the one we have selected. But as a research program, certainly if there is some changes, we will accommodate. We are able to accommodate. Mm. It is a research project to optimize okay, the fusion capacity in order to offer the best option for the world energy supply when the, we will have completed the research program. Jason, were you about to say something? Well, I was actually going to, it was on a different topic, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Well, I was actually going to ask um, uh, Dr. Poulinet, uh, you know, you're on the topic of space science. Actually, this story gets at either too, just about the nature of international cooperation on, on, on huge ventures. Fusion, you know, the eater is enormous. That's an international project by its scope. Also, space is an international uh, concern because there's, you know, there's one space that's for all of us. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the uh, if, there, if there's a conflict between the military use of space and then civil uses for things like one of the fields that I know you've been studying a great deal, Dr. Poulinets, which is earthquake forecasting using um, using the ionosphere. Uh, do you see, how, how do you see the, 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 the is there a big conflict um, between these two uses of space and do you have any concerns about the militarization of space? Um. No, I don't think uh, that it is conflict between uh, these directions uh, inside the same country, you understand? Uh, because uh, every country has its scientific program of the space research and some part of the military program. but. Uh, when we go the inter to the international scale, so uh, here appear, appears uh, the source of conflicts because uh, we are developing technologies which are, uh, give possibility to change the orbit and to approach to different space vehicles and it is uh, everybody feels uh, the threat that somebody uh, could do something with uh, his uh, vehicle but uh, i think that the only way to it is to develop uh, wider the international cooperation to make uh, the common project. For example, our Institute, uh, Institute of Space Research uh, put uh, several devices on the European mission to Mars, which is working now. And uh, we put um, devices to the mission to the moon. So uh, the Russian uh, uh, large uh, radio telescope and uh, uh, had uh, devices from Germany. And this is way uh, then the people, the scientists meet uh, together, do common work, and it is the best way to avoid the military conflicts. And so I think so. 
uh, but uh, what uh, I, I will finish uh, to uh, avoid the these conflicts we should create the good uh, agreements on the peaceful use of the space and unfortunately uh, recently uh, United States left some of them and this creates an unstable situation. Would anyone else like to respond? Okay, um, this next question is for Dr. Polushek. The questioner says, uh, my question is on the implications of direct fusion drive for Artemis, the gateway and moon villages. Where does DFD stand with relation to these projects? That's a great question. And remember, direct fusion drive is many years off. So if we're landing people on the moon by, say, 2024, 2028, it really won't be ready to support that. One architecture where DFD could be valuable is a, is a transport of material. So if you want to move a lot of material between Earth orbit and lunar orbit, and you had enough time to do it, in other words, it was not a vehicle with people on it, because you would not want to expose them to cosmic rays for long periods of time, then it could be a way of moving a lot of mass so that we could expand lunar set settlements. But at the moment, it's really not in a position to support Artemis uh, as it's going on now, which is pretty much following the Apollo template. I actually have a question for you, Dr. Polushek. So your design is quite small compared to, for example, ITER, and it obviously has a slightly different purpose. Do you think that work being done on fusion for space propulsion and space power could help make advancements for the development of fusion here on Earth? Absolutely. I mean, the work being done on ITER helps us. We read all the technical papers and all the plasma physics, the uh, areas of controlling the plasma and ITER, directly relevant to us. And so any time you look at a area in, in plasma physics, whether it be our machine, which is one type of configuration, there are mirror machines, there are accelerators, everybody benefits. Because anytime you look at something from a slightly different point of view, you may discover new things. And we're always talking to people who work on tokamaks, the plasma physics lab. They have a different configuration, the National Spherical Tokamak Experiment. And we're constantly exchanging information and ideas with them. So the more people working in this area, the better off everybody is. Okay, this next question comes from somebody in Berlin, Germany, and they're asking about the timeline. They ask um, two questions. When will the first fusion power plants be finished for using electric energy? And when will mankind settle on the moon and Mars? So I throw that out to anyone. <laughs> I, I, I'll probably make, make some comment. <laughs> uh, you know, we do get the joke. Fusion has always been 30 years away and always will be. Uh, it's taking a while, and it's going to take a while longer. Uh, my personal opinion is that we don't really know. <laughs> uh, it, I think it could be done in 15 to 20 years. Or it could take 30, 40 years. Uh, we're all watching to see uh, how ITER goes, and we're all looking at a bunch of, as I mentioned in my talk, a bunch of uh, ideas to see if we can get the fusion with something a little smaller uh, that might be able to be built uh, faster than ITER. Uh, ITER has uh, really advanced the capabilities around the world to make the kinds of equipment that uh, any fusion machine in the future may need. So it certainly uh, will allow any idea that people have for moving faster uh, to, a, to a timeline goal uh, uh, more, more doable. But uh, the truth is that right now, none of the countries 
have a commitment for any kind of a time scale that say, well, we're going to have fusion on the grid by such and such a time. You will hear various advocates of various uh, uh, concepts, uh, especially in the private sector, to say 10 or 15 years they'll be making some electricity. But, uh, you know, that's sort of about the fastest you can imagine doing it, but it could well take longer. You know, my personal opinion is that maybe by the year 2045 or 2050, there will, will, will be at least one fusion reactor putting electricity on the grid, but there's not going to be a hundred. <laughs> And you know, and in order to make a dent in the electricity market, uh, a few fusion reactors is not going to make a dent in the percentage-wise of the uh, of the, uh, the the energy need. So, even when you have the first one, say in 15, 20 years, uh, it's going to take decades before fusion is making, say, 30 percent of the world's electricity. No. Oh, I would, I would kind of wonder why it has, um, in other words, did it have to uh, have to take this long? I mean, so Steve Dean just brought up this joke that fusion's always some number of years away. Um, why is that a joke? I mean, in other words, wasn't was that correct when it was said, let's say, 30 years ago? Um, were those estimates wrong, uh, unavoidably wrong, or was this just a lack of a commitment to, to make a breakthrough that could have already happened by now? If I may comment, Steve, okay. From my point of view, uh, you know, ITER is a very sizable equipment. It takes uh, nearly 25 years with the seven ITER members, which are representing quite a large share of the world industrial capacity to build it. And so it took quite long in order to uh, assemble this large coalition from my point of view, is the first question. People know from the beginning, from my point of view, that we need quite large equipment in order to be able to demonstrate the uh, feasibility of uh, hydrogen fusion. Second, uh, the, 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 the quality of the work which has to be done in order to ensure the condition for this uh, okay, uh, burning plasma is quite strict. Could you imagine, for example, that just to manufacture one of the nine vacuum vessel sectors, which are a double wall, stainless steel pieces uh, weighing more than 450 tons, nearly 20 meter high, by the best company in the world, it took nearly six years. So from my point of view, we are now passing a point where uh, the feasibility of this development are quite predictable. And from my point of view, if we succeed to our first plasma by 2025, and still it is a challenge, and also after what we call the stage approach, where we will okay, complement the installation in order to have, for example, the recycling of the fuel and all this uh, uh, also uh, breeding system uh, of the tritium, we uh, are complying our goal by 2035 for full fusion powers. My belief is that the engineering capacity, the industrial capacity will take over our result and develop uh, fusion power more rapidly than some people believe. And that's why I am fully online with what Steve said a few minutes ago. By the mid of this century, we will be at a turning point where uh, this technology will have demonstrated its capability or not. And if it has demonstrated its capability, it will be developed very rapidly. We could not sustain to go on burning fossil fuel as we do it now. And so we know whatever the development of the renewable energies, we will need a complementary way of producing predictable massive power. So from my point of view, even in the past, it was right that fusion was always 50 years ahead because we have not taken the proper measure. Now, I do believe we have taken the proper decision to move on a steady state in order to demonstrate the capacity of hydrogen fusion. Thank you very much. And, uh...
I this would next like to add to the, sixth, ah. to the second question about Moon and Mars. Uh, it is connected with the previous one about radiation belts. Uh, it is not a problem to bring the people to Moon and Mars uh, because it was already done but still remains the problem of the long stay of people on moon and mars it is uh, solar radiation we have no enough good measures to protect people from radiation so i suppose the main problem will be not the transport of people to the planets but to protect them from the solar radiation. Oh, Dr. Kim is back. It sounds like I might be back. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. Oh, yes, we hear you very yeah. clearly. Okay. Oh, That's wonderful. Good. In that case, I will ask the question I have been um, postponing, hoping you would return to us. Um, this is a question about the development of South Africa particularly. The questioner asks, how is it that South Africa has been able to secure such a vastly different standard of living than other nations in Africa? Why has South Africa been able to develop nuclear power um, while other African nations haven't? Although I think you did partly address some of the developments there in your remarks. Um, and they ask, is it because of the historic economic advantage, a conscious fight against supranational institutions like the IMF and other efforts to impose constraints on development? I think that's a difficult question to ask. I mean, one of the things was, of course, that the, the Cape Sea route was very important since the, the late 1400s when Portuguese explorers first rounded the Cape on their way to India. And so there was a lot of economic activity that occurred um, around Cape Town. And because of the importance of that, the British moved in, the Dutch moved in, the French moved in. There were a whole lot of people that came in and uh, into South Africa. Some of the early Dutch settlers were only interested in settling on farms and having their cows and their crops. They were very religious people that had left Holland. Uh, Two internal republics deep in the country were formed. One was called the Transvaal and one called the Orange Free State. And there was a rural lifestyle there based on farming. And then sort of fortunately or unfortunately, depending on whose point of view you look at, diamonds was discovered in one and gold was discovered in the other. And that attracted the business people, the industrialists, and that ended up in the famous Boer War at the end of um, the 1800s and into early 1900s, where interestingly, Russia came and fought on the South African side, and so did the United States, and so did some French people. There was a famous French general that came and fought for South Africa. And so there was this complete mixture of people, and this was uh, to do with the discovery of, of, the, of the wealth. And that, I think, was something that catapulted the country forward a lot. That didn't happen to some of the African countries that were deeper in. Then over the years, South Africans have shown a lot of initiative, and... Uh, We've frequently isolated and so on, so that people found their own solutions. South Africa is actually, I think, the third oldest nuclear country in the world. We were in on this very early. The South African Atomic Energy Corporation, the Nuclear Energy Corporation, was uh, established in 1948. The American nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, AEC in America, Atomic Energy Commission in America, was established in 1946. So we were only two years behind. So nuclear has been going a long time here, and there's just been a lot of interest. Even now, there's a youth nuclear society of a couple of hundred young people that see nuclear as a, as a career option. And part of what we see here is this unreasonable uh, attack by extreme green organizations trying to prevent African countries from getting into nuclear technology, not only African countries, many countries, supposedly to save the planet. And it does not appear to be the case at all that the carbon dioxide produced by mankind is actually the problem, as Dr. Pulinets pointed out. But part of what we need is we need society to listen much more to scientists, but we need scientists to talk to society. And there's been a traditional divide there. 
Scientists talk very technical language to each other. They think that they're reducing the language sometimes when they go from postgraduate level to just undergraduate level, but they're still about four or five years ahead of what the average member of the public can understand. And then it's the politicians and the people holding the money, like the bankers, who are the ones that largely determine where society goes. So I think it's terribly important that science must much more explain to society what's going on. Things like tokamaks, things like nuclear-powered engines for space and so on. That's the leading edge of thinking, which one of these days will lead to nuclear reactors on land, which will supply power for the lights in the street. It's this sort of thing that is going to advance society, and that's what we need to get right. And so it's important. So I think that clearly, uh, at the moment, Africa desperately needs more electricity. And they've been told to go for things like solar and wind options because that's supposedly in the interest of the planet when it plain and simply isn't and as paul dreesen pointed out it's killing people here in africa they're dying because they they do not do not have fundamental electricity deeper in africa many of the countries there are 15 percent electrified for example it's immoral to tell them they can't get more electricity and at the moment it looks of one of the best ways to do it is small modular reactors of various types of which the South African PBMR and another variant, the HTMR 100, that has also been developed here, a simpler version of the PBMR, uh, are solutions for Africa and elsewhere. So we need to put those solutions into operation. And we, we can't be held back because somebody else's politics is, is holding us back. I think countries like Russia, I've been to Russia a number of times, they're very similar problems to us socially. You see it in South America, you see it in Indonesia, you see it in India. There's many countries that are in the same position. We have a very advanced first world element to South Africa, but at the other end, we have people living in mud huts. And we've got to bridge this divide. And that is the situation faced in many parts of the world, and it needs attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Glad we have you back with us. Uh, so this... This question is directed to anyone on the panel. Let me find it again. Um, so this is to anyone. Um, the question is, how could the development of fusion power affect mankind's ability to deal with the dangers of asteroid and comet collisions with Earth? What is sometimes called the strategic defense of Earth? Well, I can start an answer to the question. A fusion rocket would allow you to intercept an asteroid earlier and would be, the earlier you intercept an asteroid, the easier it is to push it so that it won't hit the Earth. So that's one of the uh, pot, uh, potential advantages of fusion technology. You could also do with other kind of technology, nuclear thermal, nuclear electric, but fusion would allow you to do it. Yeah, especially if I think there was one. I think what's also important is when one's dealing with something like fusion and so on, that's the leading edge of thinking. And you need to encourage the leading edge of thinking. We've been hearing for a while now about this fourth industrial revolution. And what the fourth industrial revolution is, is take the tools at your disposal and see what ideas you can come up with. If you get more tools at your disposal, whether it's fusion technology, whether it's more advanced fission technology and so on, uh, also better uh, telescopes and mechanisms for looking into deep space to detect asteroids and so on, when they're still far away, the navigation to get there very accurately, all of that needs to come out from the advanced thinking which needs to be encouraged. Once you have got much more information at your disposal with more tools to deal with it, then you can go out and get get those asteroids early because what happens with the asteroid if you detect it early enough with a small deflection you can send it away but if you get it too late then even if you blow it up you still effectively blast the earth like a shotgun so what we need is to be able to just advance technology generally and that means things like fusion thinking and many other types of thinking should be encouraged because that's where the earth is leading and where the gulf comes even greater between what the scientists understand and what the public can understand what the scientists are trying to tell them. So we need to try and be aware that that gulf is dangerous if we don't make efforts to, to inform people what's going on. Jason, were you about to respond as well? well 
Well, I was, uh, well, I think that Dr. Kemp covered it, but I was actually going to ask um, Dr. Kemp if he could come back to the, the question from earlier where we had some audio problems, which was about what if fusion had been achieved in the 1990s, let's say, uh, what could Africa look like today? I'd really like to hear. I, I think thoughts. undoubtedly, a few, a few, yeah, I think you know, if fusion had been achieved, of course, the idea would be that you'd be able to produce incredibly cheap electricity in great volumes, and that would have made a huge difference. Like even the current nuclear in South Africa, nuclear power is the is the cheapest power by far, but there's political resistance against it. But certainly, if fusion had come about in the 1990s, for example, such that it was economically viable, and you could place them wherever you want to and get fuel, uh, which is effectively from seawater. So those problems would have been solved and it would have led to very cheap electricity. And that should be an objective is to try and get the cheapest possible electricity we can. This is distributable as much as possible because that enables people to think and to come up with solutions to solve the sociological problems which we have. And when we get people now, as Paul Dreesen said, who come along and say, in the interests of the planet, they're going to put the brakes on development. It just causes many more people to die. In fact, I believe that if coal-fired power stations were built in Africa, many more, it would reduce CO2 emissions. Now, that sounds back to front. And the reason why is that there are tens of thousands of people that have cooking fires outside uh, informal dwellings, and they just burn wood, charcoal, dung, anything they can get hold of. That's producing a lot more atmospheric pollution and a lot more CO2 than a controlled, high-efficiency coal-fired power station. So one has got to look at scientifically at what are the solutions for mankind, and we've got to stimulate all over, which includes the, the physics of tokamak development and toroidal devices one way and another, and fusion and so on, because it's that leading-edge science which eventually becomes the economically viable science that goes into everyday devices. So we need to encourage all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the whole platform overall of electrification, like leaving CO2 aside for a moment, if you talked about air pollution in terms of having an immediate effect on human health, building coal power plants in areas that don't have electricity, of course, reduces air pollution, certainly experienced mm. air pollution compared to, you know, a fire in your home. I mean, that's that's a lot of pollution right there. Mm. Now, this is why nuclear is a solution for Africa. There's too many people who see nuclear, big nuclear, as being for the advanced first world, and it's not the case. Uh, building pebble bed type reactors, small modular reactors now of 100 megawatts, even down to 10 megawatts, there's designs for one megawatt. I believe there'll be nuclear power on, on Mars, for example. There's, there's not any other alternative. So going for small nuclear and understanding that nuclear is the future, I'm convinced in 100 years time, 200 years time, children will be taught way back at the beginning of the 2000s when mankind wasn't sure about the transition to nuclear. Just like now we look back a century and say, good heavens, uh, horse-drawn carts in London and places like this gave way to trams and motor cars. These were all considered harebrained schemes. Wooden sailing ships gave way to steamships. All of these at the time were massive transitions in the psychology of society. I believe we're right in one of those now. We're in a psychology where we've got to understand that nuclear is the right answer. Uh, you find, for example, the, the false impressions that there are around the world. Look at Fukushima. At Fukushima, not one single individual was killed by nuclear radiation. Not one single individual was harmed by nuclear radiation. No private property was harmed by nuclear radiation. People died because of forced removal, because they had heart attacks, because they were forced to move out of their houses in a hurry. But nobody died from nuclear. So Fukushima was not a nuclear accident. It was a conventional industrial accident, as happened at the oil refinery down the road, and as happened at the um, airport and the shopping center and many others. Uh, Chernobyl as well, the same thing there. The total deaths in Chernobyl were something like 50. But the figures that go around the world in some circles are thousands and millions and so on. So the psychology that's created to be anti-nuclear and effectively anti-progress is huge. And uh, Dr. Pulinets mentioned that type of thing very much. I've talked to many senior politicians and bankers and often I walk away appalled at their lack of understanding. 
Then I say to myself, but what have we told them? You find bankers haven't the faintest idea how nuclear works. They vaguely read about it in, in Fair Lady or Vogue or something like that maybe, but they really have little understanding. And this gulf is getting bigger. The, the gap between somebody talking about toroidal fusion devices, tokamaks and so on, and then talking to some person in the, in the pub is huge. And we've got to address that problem. Otherwise, there's a scare reaction. People say, I don't understand it, I'm opposed. Let's block it. And uh, we can't allow that to happen. So <clears throat> we've got to much more talk to people and get them to understand what's going on. We've, uh, nuclear medicine was mentioned by Philip earlier. South Africa exports nuclear medicine all over the world now to over 60 countries. And uh, there too, when you say to people, we want to deliberately inject you with some radioactive material, a lot of people get scared. You would explain to them beforehand, this is very mild, it all disappears within a few days, and it's highly beneficial. But the whole system at the moment of medical aid and so on and so forth doesn't make that easy. The system can be very easy to point, and where it is working, it's working exceedingly well. But we need to really go out and do a much bigger campaign to explain to people why these things are so important and, and why they have to believe in them and believe in the scientists such as all you fellows that are here today that, that know what you're doing, um, but it's difficult to get ordinary people to understand what's going on. Which is obviously part of the purpose of you all giving us your time today, which is really wonderful. Um, we have a question which I'll direct first to Dr. Bigot and then to Dr. Polushek and anyone else on helium-3. The question is, uh, what would be the advantages to moving to helium-3 as a fusion fuel? And what are the prospects of mining helium-3 on the moon? Okay, thank you very much for this question, but many other people could answer maybe. Helium-3 is also one of the possibility for fusion, definitively. But as you know, it is very tiny quantity on the world. So if there is a sources of a larger, larger sources of helium-3, yes, it could be an option. Replacing, for example, this tritium, as it has been demonstrated okay, uh, on some of the slides. But so far, there is not. So yes, if uh, there is easy way to get this uh, material from uh, okay, the, the, uh, in the universe, it will be interacting. And I know some people are thinking about that. Mike, mm. would you like to say anything since your design uses helium-3? Right. Our design is much smaller. And a lot of the advantages of helium-3 reside in smaller designs. One of the mm. problems that helium-3 deuterium reaction, while that is has no neutrons, you do have side reactions. And the other problem is that you have to get the very high temperatures. So the tokamak fusion test reactor reached about 50 kilo electron volts. You need to get closer to 100. So that's, that is a problem, which deuterium tritium does not have as much. They don't have to heat it as quite as high a temperature. But as pointed out, the supply of helium-3 on the Earth is very small. If you were to use it now, you may be, suppose you could actually burn it in a reactor, you're talking about 100 megawatts of power, which is a tiny fraction, perhaps valuable for some uh, very high value applications, but not for general power. In terms of helium-3 mining on the moon, there is helium-3 in the regolith. Um, it would be expensive and complex to mine. It's an economic problem. What does it cost to get helium-3 back from the moon to the Earth? And no one really knows. There, are, there have been a lot of studies, but they're just speculative. Also, the gas giants have helium-3 in their atmospheres, and that's another possible source. But again, it's something where people have done a lot of paper studies and they're good quality studies. But until you actually start building the technology, to do these kind of things, to mine the moon, to go to the gas giants and extract helium-3. It's all very difficult to know whether or not it could have a major impact on fusion, uh, fusion energy development. I mean, right now the DT approach is good because deuterium is widely available and tritium can be bred. So there is an ample supply of those few and fuels and that's why all the mainstream fusion efforts are using DT. Dr. Dean, do you, would you like to say anything about this? I think the subject was thoroughly and correctly just covered. Very good. 
Uh, well, I would like to ask one final question, and then after that, I will. Um, I'd like to ask all of you to give summary remarks. So, the final question is from the United States, from the Bronx, New York, to be specific. Um, this is from a young person, and he says, "I want to suggest that we have a panel like this, which can be several hours long, for young people, just on this question of energy and the direction of the future." I have talked about the idea of a space CCC or a space civilian conservation corps, which means space research centers built inside the Bronx where I live and other poor areas. And this should be from all over the world. But young people need to get on a Zoom platform with many of you and ask questions. Will you do this? Yes, as absolutely. This is the type of thing that you do need to do. And this is what I've been saying. And I quite a lot to go around to various schools and places like that and chat to people. And what you find as well is that some very well-meaning people have got such incredibly misguided ideas. Uh, it's not that they're trying to be negative. It's just that they so don't understand something that we take for granted that they come to such incredibly false conclusions People believing that radiation is something like honey that will drip down off a table onto the floor or something. And you try and explain it's got to go in straight lines. And there've been that one actually happened to me. And there's numbers of others as well where you just cannot believe what people uh, believe, the layperson. Then you say, well, who told them the truth? And we don't. So I think it's very important for these young people to get this because what do we see on the other side, like with the uh, the extreme greens to put it bluntly we see school children marching in the streets telling them they're all going to have it they're not going to survive to the end of the lives of their natural generation because the planet's going to collapse and so on so there's there's a lot of um, problems like this i also think particularly with things like space i think space advance is going to go a lot faster than we think if you look at the spacex rockets that have been launched now there's one going up about every 10 days uh, they've been made to to reverse down. Now, if just a few years ago, if somebody had said, imagine a rocket that takes off a vertical rocket, goes all the way up to space, then reverses backwards and lands on its own legs on the place that it took off from, you say, no, no, that's space, that's science fiction, that's not going to happen. But it, it has. Uh, the, the Mars Starliner has launched a, a couple of test flights now. And it comes back and lands down. That's going to go to Mars and is designed to carry many people. I think we'll see a Mars base in no time. I think we will see the mining of the moon. We will see the mining of asteroids. Uh, the gas giants may be supplying helium-3. I think a lot of these things are going to come about. Just cast your mind back only a few years prior to GPS and your cell phone. And if somebody had said, do you know about GPS? I knew about that when I was a student, but that was for aircraft carriers with two meter diameter and antennas aimed at satellites, multi-million dollar systems. Well, that I'll believe for an aircraft carrier. Now somebody said, but you can have GPS in your car. I would have said, no, that's impossible. You'll never be able to do that. It's, it's beyond good sense, but we do it today. Emails and so on and so forth. It's, it's unbelievable what we now accept as reasonable, which only a few years ago completely wasn't reasonable to the man in the street. We as scientists know that in the not too distant future, the next five, 10 years, there are other things that are going to come about, which sound now completely unreasonable, let alone what's going to happen in 20 to 30 years time. There's, there's things that we can't even believe are going to happen. So even more reason to keep the research going on fusion, tokamaks, toroidal, all sorts of devices in any ways like this too, because things are going to happen that you just can't conceive of now. So yes, we need to chat to the young people and say, look, try and let your imagination understand what we could conceivably have in the pipeline because it's, it's there, it's coming. Thank Daily. you very much. Mm. Uh, who would like yeah, to go next? So I'd invite you to respond and also if you'd like to make summary remarks. If I may, just a, okay, rebounding on what this young fellow from Bronx is saying. I do believe we need a much larger education. And these new uh, electronic devices offer us a unique chance to share directly the one which are now in charge of uh, developing some uh, 
uh, research for preparing the future of the world with the young generation to motivate them to consider science uh, as a as a, it was said a few minutes ago a, a real asset for the world to overcome the difficulty we face is why i am pleased to see all the uh, speakers today accepting to spend four hours nearly okay to be able to answer to the public and maybe uh, it will be largely broadcasted and uh, uh, impact uh, okay some uh, new motivation myself as a eater organization i receive a lot of requests from the young generation from the young fellows and every week i pick one or two of them and i offer them to have a 15 minute skype with me and i could say usually is very very interesting and attractive thank you very much i just like uh, to add that the fact that uh, bernard has to be congratulated he's in the midst of a very very difficult uh, construction management task, and yet he has he has shown so much willingness and uh, to broaden out and make opportunities available for young people through his internship programs and and various other things like he's just described. And Dr. Dean, would you like to respond and make any closing remarks? No, I've enjoyed the the. Uh, the few hours here that we've had together and uh, hopefully we can all uh, keep in a little better communication as we go forward. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Polushek, would you like to respond and make any closing remarks? I think it's important that young people get involved in science and technology and it is the obligation of everyone who is doing research and development of it as we all are doing to make sure that happens. I mean, we hire a lot of interns and we find interns are a great source of enthusiasm and oftentimes really great ideas. We talk to schools, we talk to elementary schools, middle schools. So this is all an excellent thing to do. And the important thing in general is to make sure that people are educated consumers of the information they get so they can make decisions, so they can support technologies or things that are are good for society and they know and they're able to make their own decisions because they're getting all the information. Thank you. And Dr. Pulinets. Okay, it was a very nice night for me because we have already the deep night. Uh, I suppose uh, and I support uh, uh, Professor Kim that uh, we should make wider scientific propaganda, may I say, uh, to young people, because we should bring this idea uh, and they should understand it, what we propose. This is the first thing. The second one, uh, we discussed uh, the way uh, about energy for us, uh, how to support our planet. And uh, we see the perspective uh, for the fusion. It is only the middle of this century. And what to do during these 30 years between today and the middle of the century. And again, I want to support uh, Dr. Kim that uh, the nuclear power, uh, it is the only uh, possible alternative to the uh, thermal uh, power plants uh, using coil, oil, and so on. And uh, now this technology is uh, safe and uh, will provide uh, the energy to different countries, especially for Africa, which needs this energy. So, and uh, the last thing uh, that uh, we should develop uh, the wider scientific cooperation like ITER. We have many areas for such cooperation in physics, medicine, space, 
and so on. And we should uh, provide efforts to organize this wider international scientific cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Jason for our final word here, I just want to say that the um, founder and president of LLP Fusion, who's the company whose work on proton boron boron fusion came up earlier, was considering responding um, and giving us his comments on his work. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I would invite him to please either write or record a video response, and we would be happy to include it in the conference proceedings. Um, so now let me go to Jason. The kind you, of optimism that... Go ahead. Now we hear you. Oh, I, the optimism that, that came across in this discussion is something that, uh, I mean, I, I'm very happy with the, the request from the our young person in the Bronx. Um, happy to help uh, in any way I can on that. Because, look, there's something that, Something very bad happened uh, 50, 60 years ago. You know, through the 60s, between the time of yet yeah, the, the assassination of Kennedy, the assassination of other leaders, uh, the creation of a total shift in culture, uh, a rejection of the past. I mean, some of that was correct, but much of it wasn't. Um, a, tend, a tendency towards thinking that development is a problem, that uh, the earth is imperiled in a dramatic fashion and that the way to fix these things is to hold back on technological progress or that science is creating problems or development is creating problems in fact it's exactly the opposite you know as um as kelvin Kem discussed the use of bio you know just like dung and what have you for for fuel that's that's very bad for your local environment inside your home if you're burning wood in the middle of it um the worst kinds of conditions as described by Paul Dreesen in terms of, uh, you know, resource work of, you know, children working in cobalt um, mining, um, poor conditions for that in the Congo. These are poor areas, relatively poor areas, whereas in areas that are more developed, you find a much generally a much cleaner uh, living situation, a much improved one. So progress was really hijacked as a concept from what it used to mean in the 40s and the 50s, which was getting power out to people, getting power out to farmers, bringing electricity to the world, ending colonialism and imperialism at the end of World War II. Roosevelt intended that he was not planning to defeat the Nazi and the Japanese empires to let the British Empire just keep doing its thing totally opposed that, said we're going to free all of these colonies, including yours, Winston Churchill. So the idea that instead we now should say, well, no, let's, we've gone too far, let's go back. And the effect that this has, especially on the poorest people within, you know, the United States and especially around the world, uh, of the withholding of energy sources that can make their lives much better is unconscionable and has to be rejected. And the other thing is that I mean, in my mind, achieving international cooperation on big things like ITER is great. We should be doing it on so many broader levels. The Chinese Belt and Road Initiative that Helga Tseplerouche described in the first panel, this big push towards cooperation and infrastructure with neighbors, you know, where, where is that sense of huge infrastructure advancement in the United States or Europe right now? We don't have it in the same way, and we would benefit so much from these, these broad projects, from it dramatically increasing the funding for science, for space. And I think that the optimism that this can create from seeing new breakthroughs, from seeing these new developments, from seeing poverty eliminated you know, from year to year around the world, this will be a real balm for people. And I think a very important part of you know, reconnecting around what it is that makes us human this shared ability to make improvements in the lives of literally everyone on the planet. And that that is the, the kind of, you know, the kind of real direction to create, to sort of displace this tendency right now, this promoted tendency right now to break apart people's identities into small pieces, to look for microaggressions, to, you know, all, the, all this kind of stuff that we're familiar with. And part of what makes that possible is an education system that puts too little emphasis on recreating discoveries, that focuses more on, you know, assessing people within, you know, these kids within, you know, just countless tests um, and 
assessing people based on having the right answer to questions and not really having the time or the freedom to say, let's go through and let's remake a discovery. How did Eratosthenes discover that the earth was round and measure it? And how did he do that thousands of years ago? Let's do that in our school now with another school. That's something that every kid should go through. Um, is the Pythagorean theorem true? The geometric proof isn't hard, but it's almost never done. And so people just get this habit of thinking they know things when really they don't. And the real problem in that is that this acquaintance with the discovery process itself is something that we really need to cultivate in young people to have the most fruitful next generation of scientists and thinkers and people who are able to understand and appreciate what we have in common as human beings on this planet and what sets us apart from the animals. Thank you very much. Jason, I want to thank all of our speakers very much for your time, for what you've contributed to our discussion today. I especially want to thank Dr. Bigot, Dr. Poulinets, and Dr. Kim, for whom it's quite late at night at this point. So thank you very much for being willing to stay up for our discussion. Um, so that's it for uh, day one of the Schiller Institute conference. We will be convening again tomorrow morning, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and I have to look again at the title of our third panel. Um, for panel three, the Belt and Road Initiative becomes the World Land Bridge, FDR's unfinished business. So thank to our, thanks again to our speakers. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow morning. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.